say hello briefly and then goodbye, but only goodbye from this committee um, because of course I continue to be available um, to chat anytime on Safe House School issues or anything else. Um, and yeah, I just really want to extend my own thank you for the opportunity to serve on both the rulemaking advisory committee and then on this SRAC. I was briefly calculating that it has actually been four years and that's kind of amazing. Um, but special thanks to Leanne and the team for all of the work um, that you all put in um, and continue to put in. It's really been um, you know, an honor to be a part of this uh, really important process to work with all of you, determining how we distribute these incredibly limited resources to address the incredibly overwhelming number of inequities and disparities that we see in our transportation system all over the state. Um, just when we're talking about youth traveling to school, not even not even anything else, although those conversations trickle into um, and have trickled into. Um, you know, I've really learned a huge amount from each and every one of you um, on the committee, and it's um, it's been an amazing process just to know that we all come from really different backgrounds and perspectives, and that we've been able to come together and um, make these decisions, create the criteria to figure out how to spend this money. Um, it's always been difficult. It will probably always be difficult because we're working in a constrained environment, but I'm just super appreciative to everyone who shows up and continues to show up to, to really um, you know, create the space, to be in the space, to keep your minds open, to listen, listen to other perspectives and um, you know, to work together to figure out how do we build our transportation system so that it can start to work for those that's really kind of failed the most. Um, so that's, I don't have words of wisdom except just keep showing up um, for every kid in Oregon. And um, big thanks to everyone for all of your work past, present and future. Thank you very much, Kari. We're gonna miss you. Um, John, anything to add? Uh, a couple thought, quick thoughts. Um, I just, I had to rush here to get back to this meeting on time. Um, I had to step down from this committee because I was assigned to lead our emergency operations center in Jackson County for both COVID and for the fire, the massive fires that we had down here. And I had to rush back here because I was just, I was leaving our vaccination clinic that we stood up today for the first time. We're trying to get 6,000 vac vac vaccinations done today. And as I was just driving back and I appreciated that it's, it's nice to be involved with worthy causes. It's nice to be involved with things that make a difference and matter. And I consider safe routes to be one of those things. I consider this program to be one of those things. And so thank you for all of you for all your hard work. I think you, this does make a difference. This is a good thing that you're doing. And uh, thank you, especially to Leanne and the ODOT staff. I think uh, this safe routes program somehow kind of cherry pick some of the best talent we have around. And uh, I think you're being well led committee. So thank you for the ODOT staff, especially to you, Leanne. And uh, thank you for all for all your good work. Um, it, this is a worthwhile cause. And so keep keep doing it and uh, good work. So thank you all for the opportunity. Thanks, John and Kari, we will miss you both. Um, we also have the opportunity to say thank you to our chair and vice chair for the last two years, Mavis. Hart uh, was our chair and Kari was our vice chair and we actually elected a new chair and vice chair through our online forum, um, which will be Rob Interfeld will be our chair and Carolina Areta Gonzalez will be our vice chair. And um, we wanted to say a big thank you to Kari and Mavis for your uh, hard work and extra hours you put in over the last two years. Um, and since we did give everyone a chance to provide some of their wisdom, Mavis, any words to say before you pass the torch? I think keep showing up, doing your good things, and here we go. Here we go. <laughs> I love it. All right. Nice. <laughs> we are going to jump in to the rest of the agenda now. Um, thank you so much. Bye, John. Nice work getting that vaccination clinic up and running. Thank you, Kari. Um, let me get to my share the screen button. Why is this so hard for me? Oh, there it is. Big and green. That's why. Okay, so Safe Routes to School Advisory Committee. Welcome, everybody. Um, our uh, quick thing about the Zoom features. Hopefully, folks are um, are in within this world, but you're you're gonna have this um, Zoom features 
uh, menu on the bottom of your screen you, where you can mute and unmute yourself. You can start and stop your video. You can see the participants. You can see the chat. You can put things in the chat. We will use the chat function as part of this meeting today. So good to know where the chat is. And um, uh, those are the basics of Zoom. Uh, we will also be using breakout sessions today, but we'll be in control of that. So you don't have to worry about that. It'll put you in a room and pull you out of a room without you having to do any work. So um, welcome everybody. We've got a lot of new faces here today as well. Um, in order to try to emulate an in-person meeting, which we can't really do, and like the magic of, of getting to know each other a little bit better, we're going to do a very quick introductory activity. Um, Kaylin, are we, are you set up? Um, can you give me a verbal yes if we're ready to go with that activity? Don't start it yet, but. We are ready. Awesome, thank you, Kaylin. So um, after we do this activity, we will go around and do actual introductions, but we're gonna put you into small groups of three people. Um, and you're going to have uh, six minutes all together to each person gets to tell their life story in two minutes. So make it brief, hit the highlights, um, try to share a little bit about yourself and this will help us um, get to know each other a little bit better. And then we'll come back all together and do just regular introductions. But this is just a moment to try to get to know some of the other committee members. So um, any questions about that activity? All right, Kaylin, if you can zoom us into those rooms, that'd be great. Ah. I think I can see y'all. Hi, Lonnie. Hi, Mavis. Hi. Hi. Okay, so everybody has two minutes to tell your life story. Does anybody want to go first? All rushing to do it. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> All right. I will model, I will model a two-minute life story. Go right. for it. You ready? I was born in Richardson, Texas, which is a suburb of uh, Dallas, Texas, and I lived there for the first 20 years of my life. Uh, I went to school in Waco, Texas at Baylor University. I got a radio TV film degree with a minor in uh, classics because I love translating Latin. And then I moved to New York City to get the, I'd been in Texas all my life and I wanted the opposite of Texas, which at that point I decided was New York City. Um, I met a bunch of outdoorsy people and worked at Eastern Mountain Sports, which is like the REI of the East Coast and met a bunch of people who had through hiked the Appalachian Trail and decided I was going to also through hike the Appalachian Trail. So I did that. I met my now husband 30 miles into that trail and then we hiked the rest of it together and we've been together ever since. It was like we moved in together after a couple of weeks of knowing each other and I sent my tent home and uh, now we're married. Um, after the Appalachian Trail, we moved to Tucson, Arizona um, uh, to experience the desert. I worked for a conservation corps there. It's where I got into like alternative education, like outdoor education stuff. Um, and then we lived there a couple years and decided we wanted to um, go to the opposite of Tucson, which is Portland. Uh, we moved to Portland and we've been here since 2007. Um, my background is mostly, my work background is mostly in education, um, but once I moved to Portland, I moved into uh, transportation and have really learned on the job since then all about uh, what transportation issues kids have in, when getting to school. And that's how my like work in Safe Routes to School started and really blossomed and I've had a great time in Portland ever since. Um, I think that was about two minutes. Uh, anybody want to go next? I'm happy to. Great. Um, sorry. Um, so I'm Lonnie. Nice to meet you, Mavis. Nice, nice to see you, Leanne. Um, I have lived in Oregon. Well, let's see. I was I was born and raised in Salem. Um, lived here pretty much um, entirely until I graduated from high school, and I went to uh, Montana State University where I studied civil engineering and. Through and about congratulations that's been yeah years. our first one so oh that's wonderful yeah but they're in sacramento so we're gonna have to we're gonna have to see how travel allowances are at that time 
Kaylin, I'll defer to you when everybody, if you get a sense when everybody's back in. Maybe I'll stop sharing for a second so we can see better. But I'll put this back up as soon as we're ready. So do you um, recall if you could hear? has rejoined. So do you recall if you could hear me before we went into the breakout rooms? <laughs> could we hear you before we, we went into the breakouts? Yeah. I don't think so. OK. So yeah, because I finally just completely disconnected and reconnected. But I've had oh, that okay. on other meeting platforms, too. Where I'm using a Chromebook for this right now. So I'm going to call IT when we're all done with this and say, you know what? <laughs> This is becoming more frequent. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. Chris is going to take us through some um, larger group introductions. Hello, everybody. Um, brand new day today. We have brand new employees um, or uh, SREC members. And so it's a great time to <laughs> regroup and um, look into the future. Um, I just want to highlight. I'm listed twice there, and it's not because I'm an overachiever. I've just been having challenges with my uh, computer today. So if I drop off, I'm popping on my phone. So that's why um, I am doing that. So we're just going to go down this list so people can hear people's voices and also associate names to uh, faces. And um, if you can just say who you are and um, what position you are, um, where you live, and what your position is. Um, and let's start with Mavis. Hi, I'm Mavis Hartz. I live in the Grand. My position on St. Francis School is the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee member. I used to be your chair. I'm not anymore. Rob's going to take over and do a great job. Great. And we'll just go down. Trevor. My name is Trevor Arnold. I'm a lieutenant with Medford Police Department. I live, work, and play in Medford. And uh, I am the enforcement representative of the committee. Brian. Brian Potwin, Commute Options. I am the executive director and been on this committee since the inception. Kim? Is Kim on? I, I didn't see Kim. She might I, be a few minutes late. Oh, there she is. Hi, Kim. I am um, working, trying to figure out my camera here. Why is the camera not working? Hey, there you are. There, hello. So Kim, you're Bend and you are the school district? Yes. Represented. Welcome. Hi. Hi. Uh, Dana. Hi, um, I'm Dana Nichols. I am the planning manager for the city of Bandon and I represent uh, small cities and I'm also on the rapid response subcommittee. Thank you. And the new chair, Rob. Hi, I'm Rob Interfeld. I'm transportation planning manager for the city of Eugene. I represent the League of Oregon Cities on this committee. And I also serve on ODOT's public transportation advisory committee along with Steve Dickey. Great. Is Lawton on? Don't think we've heard from Lawton yet. Okay, I can we'll check my email. He may have told me he couldn't make it, but I think he can be here, but I'll double check. Okay, we'll circle back. Uh, Scott. Oh, good afternoon, everyone. Scott Bull, Oregon Department of Education, Pupil Transportation Division. Uh, I've been on the committee for four years or so, maybe. And a big shout out for to Trevor for keeping my kids and grandkids safe in Medford. <laughs> Steve. I'm Steve Dickey. I live in Salem. I uh, am uh, the transit representative, but also serve on the public transit advisory committee as well as Rob said. Luis. I'm Luis Ornelas, uh, OTSC member, and uh, I live in Portland, and I'm retired. Thank you. And uh, because we have uh, two new members, I think our challenge today is to catch acronyms. So OTSC is the Oregon Transportation Safety Committee. Uh, and I'll just try to be on that to catch acronyms as they're flying through uh, 
uh, space. Carolina, the um, uh, vice chair. Hi, yeah, my name is Carolina Ireta Gonzalez, and I work for the Oregon Health Authority as a policy analyst in the environmental health section, um, more focused on the built environment and infrastructure and um, the connections to health equity. And I'm the health representative. Thank you. Lauren. We skipped Sunny. Oh, Sunny, I'm sorry, I'll come back to you. Uh, Lauren, is Lauren on? Okay, I'm I'll double check my email and see okay. if she uh, heard from Lauren. Sunny. Hello, I'm Sunny Chickering. I'm the ODOT representative to the committee. Uh, it says I'm from Salem, but I actually live and now work in Springfield because I've been working virtually for 10 months. Uh, so that's where I am now. Uh, my title is actually Region 2 Manager, and I've been doing that for about 13 years. Thank you. Noel. Yeah, hi everybody. Noel Mickleberry. I'm the Safe Routes to School Program Manager at Oregon Metro, which is the Portland area metropolitan planning organization, and I am the MPO rep on this committee. Thank you. Zhao. Hi everyone, my name is Zhao Zhang. Um, I live just right outside of Portland, but definitely do a lot of work and play there. Um, representing the large city and safe routes practitioner representative from the Portland Bureau of Transportation or PBOT for short. Thank you. And Danny. Hi, I'm Danny Schulte. I uh, live in Pendleton, Oregon, uh, in Northeastern Oregon, <laughs> if that helps. Um, I'm an, one of the Oregon tribes representatives. I work for the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation as a transportation planner. Thank you. And now to introduce our uh, two new SRAC members, Lani. Hi everybody, I'm Lani Radke. I live in Salem and I work for Marion County. I'm the county engineer. I've been here for about a year and a half and as Leanne was saying, this is my first day, my first meeting um, as part of this committee. I'll be representing the Association of Oregon Counties, AOC. Thank you. Nice to meet you. And Eric. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Eric Osterberg. I'm the assistant to the city manager down here in Klamath Falls. Um, I just moved to Oregon uh, just about a year ago, right at the beginning of the pandemic. So that's been a it's been an interesting transition, to say the least. Um, but on the committee, I will be the small city and uh, equity uh, work uh, representative. Hey, welcome. Welcome to Oregon. So Nancy and Eric, uh, you're going to be pretty much bombarded with a lot of information for your first meeting. So if anything comes up, uh, write it down or let us know, raise your hand. Um, so you're keeping up with the committee or if there's uh, something you need follow up with, I know Leanne or I'm sure any of the SRAC members would be happy to um, uh, follow up with you. If we can go to the next slide, please. So our goals for uh, this meeting and we've got a lot to cover in um, about two and a half hours is to- yes, Can I pause you oh, just yes. a quick second? Um, oh. Can you do an introduction for yourself and maybe we can do a quick introduction for just the other presenters um, and maybe we can uh, skip all the additional ODOT staff that are here for now just for time. But um, if we could get an introduction of all the presenters, that would be great. Yeah, it was like a horse to the barn getting into the uh, getting into the agenda. Thank you. My name is Chris Wachi. Um, I have uh, had the privilege of working as the facilitator for the Safe Routes to School program um, starting way back at the beginning of the Rural Advisory Committee. And I have a little firm called Cogito based in Eugene, Oregon. And I'll turn it over to Alta. Great, thanks. Um, hi everyone, this is Hannah Dekapel with Alta Planning and Design. And uh, you'll be hearing more from me and our team later in the um, in the time, but I can go ahead and introduce um, as well. We're joined with um, Katie Celine, who's taking notes, and um, Kaylin Henley, who's helping with the um, the strategy and uh, the breakout sessions and things. Thank you. And Leanne, do you want to uh, touch base with ODOT staff right now? Those who are I know they're um, popping in. Heidi and out. can. 
Heidi, can you introduce yourself? And then if Susan's here, if you could introduce yourself. And then we'll move on. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Heidi. I'm in uh, ODOT uh, Education Safe Routes to School program. I get to work with the lovely Leanne um, on our program, and I appreciate you all being here today. You'll hear a little more from me uh, later on, and that's it. Susan, are you on? We'll let her, Susan Pythman introduce herself later. She's going to give us an update on the statewide transportation improvement program funding that the Oregon Transportation Commission is actually talking about right now at their meeting, which is happening at the same time as this. So she's gonna pop back between two meetings and then be able to give us like a real uh, in time update with what, they, what they're talking about with that um, transportation improvement program that may provide additional funding for safe routes to school in uh, the year 2024 through 27. Um, great. Take it away, Chris. Okay. And then um, for the other ODOT folks, we will circle back and have an introduction just in just a little bit because um, we have a nice representation from uh, other folks in other uh, departments and programs here. Um, so uh, as I was saying, uh, we want to affirm the SREC operating fundamentals. And this is something uh, that we'll go into greater detail about, but it's a good place at the beginning, the first meeting of the year to uh, revisit a couple key um, foundational pieces for the SREC. Um, we'll review the uh, look back in time at 2020, some key elements there, and then look at what's planned for 2021 and input on program direction. And in more detail, if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, in just a moment, we're going to ask you to approve the October meeting minutes. Um, we will see if anyone signed up for public comment. As I mentioned, we're gonna talk about the SRAC fundamentals, um, and that's really looking at the group operating agreements, doing a quick review of those um, as you did in your homework, and then also looking at the SRAC guiding principles. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. Leanne's gonna talk about lessons learned from 2020 um, and, and give you some key uh, overviews and some uh, information and some data about that. And then we move into SREC 2021 overview and Heidi's going to paint the picture of what you can expect uh, the committee's focus to be in 2021. What's really exciting is um, Hannah and the Alta team have been doing a lot of work on looking at a strategy for the program and uh, we have an opportunity to review all the good work that um, Alta has done and their expertise in doing so. And then also look at the um, input that the SRAC provided in the homework too on the program direction. Um, that will be a breakout room that we'll do once again. And then Heidi will take us into the March meeting overview, what to expect then. We'll do a quick uh, review as we do at all meetings, how the meeting went, what could be improved. Um, what to enhance the next time, and then um, give you some dates, and then uh, wrap it up as we move we, we move on. I do want to say that between uh, 2020 and 2021 overview, we will have a break in there. So um, I encourage people, if you can, uh, to keep your cameras on because it's more cohesive for the meeting, but understanding people have things to do and may need to get up and uh, leave as they would if we were in person. So um, moving on, Leanne, have you seen if anyone wants to do public comment? I, I have not seen anything in the chat. Um, and Chris, we do still need to approve the minutes. So while we're approving the minutes, if you would like to provide public comment, um, please put your name in the chat. And then as soon as we're done approving minutes, we'll call on you. Thank you very much. Great. Um, so for uh, new SRAC members, um, the SRAC works on a consensus model. Um, and the way that we have um, operated since the beginning is if you approve, thumbs up. If you fully approve and are supportive of the decision, if you can live with the decision, you're not fully supportive, but you can live with the decision. If you need more discussion and you're, you're not moving, you can't uh, agree to the decision, thumbs down. And a lot of this, go, if you've seen the charter, we go into details about that um, in terms of um, what, if we do need to go to a vote and minority reports on that. 
So you will see this in action right now. Um, may I see from the SRAC if we may approve um, the October meeting minutes. So approve, can live with it, don't. So thumbs, thumbs. Okay. And I'm just missing a couple, face it, great. Okay, excellent. All right, thank you so much. All right, moving on to SREC fundamentals. And I'll pause here. I don't see any public comment. Nope, no public comment. Thanks everybody for joining us. Um, uh, any visitors that are here, uh, you're welcome. Uh, we, we appreciate you being here and it's totally okay not to get public comment. We'll move on, thanks. Okay, um, so this next slide, um, is about the SREC uh, group operating agreements. And uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. I know it's a lot of text here. Um, these were originally developed by the Rural Advisory Committee and um, adapted and changed by the um, SRAC Advisory Committee. Um, and we, <clears throat> because they're dynamic and because this is a highly functioning group, it's uh, to date, it's been uh, an extreme extremely uh, respectful and uh, collaborative process um, and, and group to work with. Um, it's also good to always review these because they're dynamic and they change. And so with that, we asked in the homework um, if there were any changes to the group operating agreements. And so I'm just gonna go through these quickly if you'll humor me, that attend all meetings, which uh, we've had a really high rate. I don't know if we've ever looked at the percentage of people attending, but it's been extremely high. Um, and now via Zoom. Um, come well prepared to all meetings to respect each other's time and commitment. Three hours is a good chunk of time. Uh, start and adjourn the meetings on time unless otherwise direct discussed. And um, I think Leanne, you've done a really good job about keeping us on track as well. Uh, listen to understand, scoops on <laughs> honor agenda topics and times. Listen to understand. I you know, have that curiosity about other people's perspectives. Everybody is an expert in something, as we know, because we just heard the wealth and breadth of uh, people's expertise. Um, and this next one um, morphed over time, which was create and contribute to that to a brave space. And the definition is a, a space that continue, encourages dialogue, recognizes the differences or the difference, and holds each person accountable to do the work of sharing experiences and coming to a new understanding. And it's, it's hard and sometimes, or, and a lot of times it can be uncomfortable. And then the feedback, what we received from the homework, um, quite a few people said they, while they appreciated be your own equal opportunity monitor, no dominating, that suggested change it to say, step up and step back, recognize the importance of your contributions as well as making space for others. Um, another person added, recognize if discomfort occurs, but lean into it. Um, in the funding allocation too, and in our discussions, uh, the thinking statewide, not just from your own perspective, even though you may be representing a small city, it's not your small city, for instance, it is all small cities. Um, an analytical approach, facts are your friends. Um, Question personal assumptions, avoid interruptions and side conversations, which are a little harder now that we're on Zoom. Um, advantage of reason, this is one that's rather important of taking advantage of reasonable requests of ODOT staff to provide information needed for well informed decisions. Um, there's Heidi and there's Leanne um, pretty much running the show. Um, be recognized before speaking, and typically um, we have put our name tags up, but if you can raise your hand, that would be helpful. Uh, recognize, if one disagrees, do not let it become personal. Success depends on participation, ideas, ask questions, draw each other out, stay out of the weeds and the swamp, getting down into too fine a detail if we're working on a higher level. And someone had a question about, what does it mean to listen for the future to emerge? Um, that originally came from when the program was being developed and moving forward. And so someone just wanted some more information about that. Um, because be your own personal monitor and not dominate, I'm going to pause. 
and see if anyone has any additions to this or any questions about it, or if they are ready to say, yeah, we can move forward and agree to these group operating agreements. So may I get a sense um, just from people's thumbs if you are ready to accept these or you need more discussion about it? See thumbs, I see some thumbs, 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 great. Kim, if I could see you with your thumb be up, there it is. All right, great, thank you. All right, the first agreement. So um, that's how we do it, Eric and Lanny. <laughs> that's good. Okay, so then we um, asked about uh, guiding principles and these are important to uh, pay attention because the, the genesis of these six guiding principles um, really helped create the foundation, the, the approach, the uh, integrity of the program, uh, the, and, and also serve uh, to inform funding decisions or funding priorities that um, will go, whether it's education or it's construction. Uh, in talking with Leanne, we knew that we would get a lot of feedback on these. I'm going to highlight high level things that we heard, but this warrants discussion um, more than we have time. And so our request is, um, as you go through this, if you're willing to be on a subcommittee to further refine these and help um, bring it back to the SRAC in March, that would be helpful. And if you could indicate that in the chat. Um, these are not in any particular order, um, but they do serve as a pivotal piece of the SRAC's work and um, commitment to, to the funds. Um, maximize resources. I'm not going to read through this because you saw this in your homework. Um, the input we had was, oh, it's comprehensive. Another person said, ah, oh, this reads a little rough. There is a comment um, that Larger communities are called out here because they may have other funding sources. And it came up a couple times for an SRAC members that you need to consider that larger communities uh, also have larger safety needs, have more safety needs, and could be more expensive. Um, the person who wrote that, uh, would you be willing to say anything more about that right now? We didn't ask for a name. Sure, that was me. Um, oh, thanks, Noel. I think I was just saying this in, in context of the fact that we also have a geographic balance principle, and that seems to capture the need, obviously, for funding in all communities. It just seemed strange to call out this out specifically in maximizing resources because um, there are huge, huge needs in, in larger communities, even if there's more funding. Um, so that was that was all. Thank you. Thank you for highlighting that. Okay, communication, coordination, and collaboration. Um, there was an interesting point that, you know, we only call out elected and appointed boards. Um, uh, we only highlight a few, but the point was there are many more uh, appointed positions that uh, would be helpful to reach out to. So fire districts, transit, school, recreation districts. Um, and then there's some wordsmithing on this one. So for health, um, uh, there was a concern, we'll reword it, and then um, the, we haven't really defined health equity. And so there's some um, refinement and some clarity requested in these, um, in, for this particular um, guiding principle. And please, by all means, if you want, if you want to add something to it, or something comes to mind, or you want to round out what I'm just giving a high level on, please tell me. Uh, geographic balance here again, um, uh, Noel. I think you uh, reiterated your point uh, in this as well. What you just uh, you phrased. Um, there is uh, some suggestions um, how funds are equitably spread out. Um, for geographic balance. And then for safety, I think this is going to be a big conversation. Um, there was suggestion to incorporate some of the Vision Zero language uh, into the safety for the um, uh, for Vision Zero for the um, 
essence of what Vision Zero is and why Safe Routes to School is a key component of achieving Vision Zero. Um, there is conversation about, do we even need to say enforcement versus engagement? Um, and then students of all abilities, that, that needs to be broadened to understand the backgrounds of, of that comment, that there's much more there um, and giving extra weight to communities of color and um, uh, indigenous folks. Um, so so there's, there's discussion that needs to happen here that, that warrants uh, more insight and thought put into it than we have uh, the time right now to do. Finally, to bring it home, uh, social equity. And again, I think that the majority of comments came around um, marginalized communities, uh, that the term is not working well for a lot of people. Um, some folks wanted to reframe that in a different way, um, call out race, and then also clarify what we mean by breakthrough outcomes. So um, I know this is like the beginning of a movie and you're seeing a trailer of it, but um, it, I think it echoes what I said that it does warrant more discussion on it. So um, could you please indicate if you are willing to spend a little time between now and the next committee and meeting in March um, to help refine these a bit more from the SRAC perspective and then present. So far we've got Dana um, volunteering in the chat. So thank you, Dana, um, for uh, expressing interest. Uh, looks like Noelle is also chiming in in the chat. Thank you, Noelle. Um, uh, we also have Mavis, awesome, Carolita, Carolina, um, also can provide support. So Katie, if you can be, um, taking down these names, that would be awesome, as well as Rob Innerfeld. Great. Um, that is a really solid group, and we would be happy to have any more people who are interested. Just just pop your name in the chat, um, um, ideally before the end of the meeting today, just indicating that you'd like to be a part of this subgroup, and we will work on um, taking all of that feedback and, and reformatting some of these and, and, and taking in these new concepts and bringing something back to this committee in March that we can then um, dig into a little bit more and hopefully find some consensus around so that we can build our future priorities on these sort of guiding principles for this year. Thank you. And I will follow up and uh, provide the survey data to you what we had rather than these high level comments comments um, that you'll get the actual verbatim comments that came in to, to help guide. Um, you know, Leon, right now we have scheduled a break at 1.45, but I'm going to suggest you go through your 2020 lessons learned and then we take a break. Um, just so we have at least an hour under our belt before we need to need to stretch. Yes, we are actually slightly ahead of schedule, which is awesome. If we end early, we end early, and then everybody can do some stretching and jumping jacks or whatever you want to do before your next meeting. <laughs> um, um, I'm really excited to be able to talk about some of our lessons learned in 2020, because that also really um, hinges on, we had a big accomplishment in 2020. Um, together, we all created priorities, we created a scoring matrix, um, we had some really great discussions around, around priorities and how to prioritize um, equity and how to prioritize safety and how, to, and how to pull all of the things that we care about together into basically a scoring criteria for an application process where we had a ton more applicants than we had funding. Um, and this group was able to, to really help uh, recommend that project list, which was ultimately funded. So here is a map that I want everybody to feel really um, proud of over the last three years, we've actually been able to fund two funding cycles of Safe Routes to School construction projects, um, equaling about it's 16 million plus 28 million. And for whatever reason, my brain's not doing that math right now, but it's like 45 million somewhere around there. Probably. <laughs> Is that right? And then, um, um, and we are, uh, and so we were able to fund uh, almost 70 uh, pro projects around the state. And this shows you where all of those projects are located. Um, these are all gonna be new uh, construction projects for Safe Route Cisco because of the work that you all put into it and in helping prioritize projects. Um, some of the outcomes for our for the last three years are these 
photos of these uh, five projects that are complete already. Um, we also have this graphic of um, showing kind of the number of improvements that are listed in all of our selected projects. So you'll note that there are over 440 um, crossing improvements that are happening because of the Safe Routes to School funding. So mostly we're funding crossing improvements, which is not, not a surprise, but a, a number that I didn't know until we did some of this analysis. So mostly crossing improvements, getting kids across those uh, busier streets in order to get to school. We're doing a lot of um, curb ramps, making it possible for uh, for students um, who are rolling to get on and off of the of the sidewalk and cross the street safely. We're doing a lot of walkways and sidewalks. Uh, we're doing some lighting, which we all know does a little helps to get kids safely to school. We're doing a lot of um, school zone indication, flashing lights, helping people know that it's a school zone um, so that they'll drive safer, safer and allow our kids to walk and bike to school. A little bit of bike infrastructure, um, bike lanes and separated bike lanes, and some creative street design, which is kind of a way to say like, um, designing the street in a way that will slow the traffic down and make it safer for kids to be able to cross. So, um, uh, so this is basically what our impact has been over the last three years and that first two rounds of construction funding that we were able to allocate. Um, the requests that came in were for a lot more projects than this. We were only able to fund um, like kind of like two uh, like one in every five projects for the first round of funding and um, about half of the second round of funding we were able to we were able to fund. So um, some of the questions that I was asking myself when I wanted to report back to you all and questions I've heard from you have been like, did our scoring matrix work? Um, the short, simple answer is Yes, we wanted to prioritize low income schools. We did that. We wanted to prioritize um, streets with these uh, safety features or, or lack of safety features like high speed, um, large crossing distances, things like that. We did prioritize those projects. So all of our funded projects were at Title I schools, which is where schools where students, 40% um, uh, or more of the students are eligible for free or reduced price lunch. Um, 83 of the of percent of the funds that we allocate will be within will be for a project within a priority safety corridor, and those are those roads with the higher risk factors, higher speeds, higher crossing distances, more traffic. 62% of the funds will go to schools with the highest percent of low income families, so night where 90 to 100% of the uh, students um, are eligible for free or reduced lunch. Um, and 46 will be spent on areas outside of a metropolitan planning organization so that we know um, um, highly populated areas as well as folks outside of those populated areas are all able to compete. And 35% of the funds will actually be spent with it within a city of a population of under 5,000. So we really wanted to make sure that small cities were able to compete in this. And, um, and from, from my estimation, they are, or from these, from these numbers, they're able to compete. Um, so this is some of our, this is, these are the things that we um, scored or said that we wanted to track. And so this is some of the, the numbers that are coming back after this round of funding. Um, we also run a program called the Project Identification Program. And that is where we can actually send a consultant to a community to do, uh, to create a Safe Routes to School plan to help them identify uh, solutions to barriers for students walking and biking to school. Alta Planning and Design actually does that work. For, for ODOT and is out there in a lot of different communities. We were, um, uh, we wanted to track how many of those communities that we've worked with in the past applied for the Safe Routes to School grant this time around, like did creating those plans actually help those communities apply? Eight out of the 14 communities we work with did apply for the grant process. Um, we also got some great feedback from those participating communities where, where we were able to help them create that Safe Routes to School plan. It felt like a good value for their time. They liked the uh, creative um, and implementable solutions that were listed in the plans. Um, it created sort of a new lens to look at local streets, like pretending to be a, ki a kid or like watching children, how they get to school, really uh, looking at it from that perspective, as well as it was a successful collaboration across jurisdictions. So this planning process, what makes it kind of special is that we require that the school community be at the table as well as the road authorities, the, the cities or the counties that, owe, that own the roads around the schools, bringing everybody to the table is how we've traditionally solved some of those problems. 
Um, and we get to work with 20 new communities in 2021 and 2022 to create 20 new safe routes to school plans um, in those communities. So that is a thriving program. We're getting a lot of great feedback from um, and another outcome of this um, great safe routes to school program that we run. So uh, here are sort of the high level lessons learned. I'll talk about the project identification program, that planning assistance first, and then we'll talk about the construction program. Um, we're gonna spend the rest of this year talking about the education side of Safe Routes to School pretty much. So we're not highlighting it here. So just hold your horses on that bit. But so I'm gonna do the planning and the construction lessons learned. So um, out in all those communities doing those Safe Routes to School plans, uh, we learned that um, communities benefited from varying levels of detail in their plans. Uh, we also learned that that collaboration is key, having the road authority there as well as the uh, school community is where the magic happens in the problem solving, having all the decision makers at the table and the people who's, uh, who are being affected. Um, there is interest in, but lack of clarity around sidewalk alternatives. Uh, we've been working a lot with Alta staff as well as some internal ODOT staff to figure out what are some of the sidewalk alternatives that we can recommend as part of this program. Um, also, there's a, there are a lot of opportunities for really quick fix style projects like signage and striping. Um, a lot of the barriers that people talk about are just like, we need a sign here, or we need a stripe here to make the road a little bit more narrow, or there's no parking here so that we can see the kids when they're crossing the street. There's some really simple stuff in those plans. Um, for the construction program, some of our um, lessons learned is that we can do a little bit of analysis around the scoring, but there are some questions that I still have when I'm looking at those um, at that analysis and that I've heard from some of you all as well. So um, the first question is, is the readiness score working? We uh, put a certain score behind project readiness and it's so that we can see that projects will be completed within five years. It hasn't really been five years yet since we funded the first project. So we're not really sure if that readiness program, that readiness number is working but we'll have more information as we move forward. So more study is needed on that. Um, ODOT doesn't really compete well in this program. Um, ODOT gets a, a like maybe 14 percentage uh, uh, of the funds. And we've got a lot that there's a lot of ODOT roads out there um, in small towns that are a barrier. So I um, want to do a little bit of study of just why. I mean, uh, not, not anything needs to change, but it's a good question to ask. Also, tribes don't compete well on this funding. We don't have that many um, applications and we don't fund them all whenever we get them. So um, tribes don't compete well either. So both of those two things need a little bit more study so that I can bring back to you some better information. And when we do, when we do this decision-making process again, you'll have all the information you need. Um, it is difficult to process lots of application data. Um, we might need an application database to help us process the, I think it was like 15,000 pieces of data that we were working with and mixing around. So this will help, uh, we might have an application database by the next cycle. Um, equity work takes time. We added additional meetings to our year this year to really dig into more of the equity conversation, how we wanna score that, how that, how that works together with the other pieces of the application scoring. So we know that that work takes time and now, and we can um, uh, plan better for those conversations in the future that we need additional time for that. Also region four and region five receive low percentages of the funds that we allocate. Why is that? So um, I brought a little bit of that information back to you today because I was able to do some of that analysis. So. In regards to like spreading the funds out across the state, sometimes people say it's like, we wanna, we wanna spread it out like peanut butter. Everybody gets a little bit. Safe routes hasn't been like that the last four years. Region four and region five don't really get that much of the funding. Good thing, bad thing, not here to say, more here to say like, this is why region four and region five don't get much of the funding. So um, what I was able to do is, uh, basically play with the scores and like if we didn't score readiness what would happen if we didn't score safety what would happen if we didn't score equity what would happen and do some sort of statistical analysis in in that way um so a little bit more of um a little bit more percentages to tell you about is that 94 percent of the projects would probably remain the same if we didn't score readiness at all. We would probably have a very similar project list. Um, and that project list would in, might include a couple of more region four and region five projects. So the readiness score affects where, where, where we fund projects. 
84% of projects would likely remain the same if we didn't score safety at all. 84% of the projects would remain the same. And we would get a lot more projects in region four and region five. Um, we've got a comment which says, can you remind me again where region four and region five is? That is excellent. So if the if um, region one, two, and three in ODOT speak is the western side of the state, pretty much everything on the um, on, on the west side of I-5. Uh, um, region four is generally the big swath that's central Oregon. Um, including Hood River, Bend, Klamath Falls. Um, region five is the eastern swath of the state, including, um, oh man, Pendleton, Baker, and a town way down in the south that I, the Oahe Canyon's down there. So that's all kind of the region five areas. And there's a map that Kaylin links to in the notes. Thank you, Kaylin. Um, so it's that central Oregon and Easter Oregon that just don't get that much of the funds that we um, that we allocate as part of this process. 82% um, uh, of projects would likely remain the same no matter how we tweaked the scores. Um, region one may benefit from some small tweaks more so than any other region and that's the city of Portland is in ODOT region one, uh, Portland and Salem. And 77 of the projects would remain the same if we did not score equity at all. So if we took equity out, we didn't, we didn't score, um, mostly we score income for equity and we didn't score that at all. 77% um, of our projects would remain the same and there wouldn't probably be any new projects in region four and region five. What this analysis tells me, the big picture is that right now, I think it's the, if we did, um, it's the safety criteria, I believe that is, that, that is meaning that we're not scoring as many projects in region four and region five. And um, these are things that we can dig into the next time that we have a, uh, a, a solicitation, which will be in 2022. So uh, we can bring this back up again, but wanted to let you know everything that we've dug into and learned about 2020. Um, and the reason why region four and region five is, is on the top of my mind right now is just because that's the conversation that came up at the Oregon Transportation Commission or a little bit on that round. So I got a lot of these questions. So I did a lot of this research and thought I would share it with y'all as well. Um, I'm gonna pass it on to the next presenter. Unless, do, if we have time for questions, Chris, let me know. If not, we can just keep chugging and folks can put them in the chat. I think we have time for questions because I, the next presenter uh, is Susan, I believe. Yeah, is Susan. Um, so we have time for a few questions. Um, thank you for the region map question, um, Carolina. So if folks do not have any questions, I think now might be a good time to stretch to break this up a wee bit. And we might be able to do another stretch. Uh, I had a question. Yes. So um, when we're talking fundings to reach more out into region four, region five, was that why you guys were kind of looking at separating out um, uh, some funds for ODOT within the Safe Rest of School stuff? Was that that conversation? Um, I think what 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 um, what what you're talking about, Mavis, is like when we set the program up during the rulemaking advisory committee. There was conversation about should um, should ODOT have have just a piece of the funding and then run its own program and not compete in this larger um, pot. Um, that's a little bit different than this. I don't think that ODOT would be. Um, I didn't. So I didn't do analysis of like if we would have scored things differently, would ODOT have have? Um, I didn't do the analysis for the ODOT projects. Um, I'll I'll do that sometime in the next year so that I can provide that information. But this is a different. It's more just like uh, region four, uh, that central Oregon uh, was allocated, I believe four to 5% of the funds that we had. Mm -hmm. um, they have about 11% of the title one schools. So they were allocated slightly less than how many schools, they, title one schools that they have. Um, uh, uh, and region five is about the same. We, we, we allocated about four to 5% for region five and they have about 11% of the schools as well. So um, less to do with ODOT, more just to do with uh, location. And I really think that that's just something that um, 
uh, people above uh, my pay grade look at, they look at the map and they're like, oh, all the dots are over here. Why aren't there dots over here? And like, that's one of the first questions they ask just because it's visual. And so that's um, why I'm, I'm very, I feel like I'm very prepared to answer that question right now. Um, although to you all that might seem a little bit skewed, why is Leanne really advocating to fund more projects in region four and region five? That's not my intent. I just wanna let y'all know like, this is how, this is what's happening right now. And this is why I think that's happening. Well, I know that um, one year we bumped one project that was ODOT funded in region five, because I mean, region five, ODOT is the one that brings through forth a lot of the, the ask because they own a lot of the roads. And right. so um, one of those projects I know got bumped when we did the, okay, so you can only have one project, which was a great way. It, it was a perfect fit for what we were looking at at the time. And I'm, anyway, yeah. We didn't, there we also, used, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, it just, uh, I imagine they're also the place like ODOT region four and region five offices are the place that have the staff to put these kind of applications together because a lot of smaller jurisdictions don't necessarily have, mm -hmm. I mean, even, you know, a planner, let alone, you know, <laughs> transportation <Yeah>. planner. Correct. <laughs> Very good point. Um, ODOT uh, oftentimes is like the main road through a town. ODOT owns the main road through the town that is the connector and the lifeblood for all of the parts of the town. And um, I will say, just so folks know that local um, communities can also put in an application where they do work on ODOT roads. So some, some of the projects that I'm talking about as local might have some uh, work on, an, on ODOT right of way in them. Um, and um, we did the first round make decisions where any entity could only get funded for one project, but we used a different way to do that this round so that, um, for example, some, some cities were awarded multiple small projects um, and any region could also be awarded multiple small projects. Um, but I will, I will say that that's one of the things that I'm curious about why do, ODOT really doesn't compete that well, even though there are lots of roads that are unsafe and I'm curious to know um, why that is. And I will figure out some way to talk about it with y'all. And so you can learn along, along with me and be prepared for our next decision-making cycle in 2022 around the construction projects. I'm gonna suggest we take a 10 minute break here. I see Susan's on, um, so we'll still be ahead of schedule, um, but we can kind of keep with the way the agenda's unfurling a little bit. Rob, you had a question though before we break? I mean, I can wait till after the break if, no, if that would be preferable. Okay, I have a few comments and questions. I'll try to not take too much time, but I think that, um, yeah, I, I think Mavis made the comment like more small towns are more likely to have ODOT roads. And so if more ODOT pro projects get funded, got funded, that could mean, I mean, those towns may be in the Western side of the state too, but it will lead to potentially more in regions four and five. I mean, I, I think the issue of ODOT competing well or not is interesting. And, you know, as you know, me and I've raised some concerns about the ODOT projects tend to be a lot more expensive too. And I know that we don't really factor that into our selection. So it should necessarily impact how competitive ODOT projects are. But I do, I would like for us as, as the ODOT projects start to get built, like the one in John Day, I would like for us to examine those and look at like, how do they work out? Were they able to stay in budget? Like one of the concerns I've raised is that if these roads don't have stormwater, we once like a curb goes down, then you it becomes like a big stormwater project in addition to a sidewalk project. And then it just like gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and I'd love to see ODOT figure out how to do more value engineering around some of these. I mean, they do bring other dollars to the table and they have a higher match percentage requirement, I think. So I appreciate that. Were there, I'd also int be interested in the end, and if, if it was easy to do, just to see the breakdown by population too, because you said like there's 11% of Title I schools in each of those areas, but is it, all, is it also 11% of the population because this, the schools may be a lot smaller? Um, did, and, you know, did we get as many applications from regions four and five? Like did they, as a percentage of the applications received, how, you know, how did they do? That's another question. Um, one last uh -huh. thing is just that in, in the last round of funding, the city of Eugene received a grant to do a non-standard sidewalk project where we're putting a curb down to separate the walking and biking area from the street without doing a sidewalk because of 
proximity to homes that are really close that are desired to have less impact. And so and we'd be happy to share that once, it, you know, it's not gonna get built for a couple of years, but I saw that you, that was one of the issues you had. Um, and also, I mean, frankly, like one of the reasons we proposed doing it that way too was because it was more affordable. So, um, which wouldn't have, again, like that wouldn't have affected how competitive it was because we don't really look at the cost as our part of our scoring, but we felt like it was just the, sort of the right thing to do to keep the project more affordable and have less impact on property owners. So I'd love to see ODOT with its, you know, vast design resources, like figure out like how to be creative on some of the, these kinds of designs too. That's all. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I don't, I don't have the numbers for the, uh, off the, off the top of my head, but these are things sure. that I definitely bring back to you. So okay. like the breakdown of the population and, um, how many applications did, uh, region four and five submit? Those are very, those are Thank easy you. numbers for me to get. I just don't okay. have them right in front of me right now. Okay, thanks. And I would encourage committee members while it's still fresh because we're just coming out of that um, the, the last construction process. Any other comments you have because we're pivoting now and going into education to really be mindful of them and send them to Leanne so we can circle back at the time um, for this neck for the construction in 2022 that that these things are brought up again. Um, I also do have a, some maps that uh, answer some of these questions pretty specifically, um, and I can pro I can find them pretty easily and and share them. Um, may or may not be before the end of this meeting, but um, okay. The, so and the, the Noel, your comment in the in the chat, I have a map that shows that. Uh, Noel asked if we could provide some Title One school percentage by their region with their funding allocation. Okay, so ten minute break. Come back here and Susan Pythman, if uh, Susan, you can start about five minutes earlier on your presentation, that would be great. So stay fresh, stretch, and we'll yeah. see you at 2.20. Okay. <laughs> Eric, uh, I have a question for you. Yes. Hi, first of all, it's really nice yeah. to meet you. And B, um, I have like, since COVID, I've just been working through all of the Star Treks on Netflix. Oh yeah. <laughs> I'm in season five of Voyager right now. I started, you know, I'm like chugging through. It's like the only happy place that I can go right now is like to watch Star Trek. <laughs> so when you showed up with that, I was like, oh, he, he gets it. Like, I want to be on the Enterprise. <laughs> <laughs> I sent him a private comment to that effect. Yeah, <laughs> oh I responded with the live long and prosper emoji. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's yeah. what that was. I thought it was a, I couldn't, it's tiny on my screen. So I thought it was a teacup. Like, yeah, for some whatever, very hot. whenever I post an emoji in here, it just kind of does the like the sketch outline is instead of the, the image. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. There are some fan films on YouTube for Star Trek that. If you can get past the different actors playing Captain Kirk and Spock, uh, they have some of the original writers from the original series from the 60s. Wow. And oh, uh, man. pretty cool the way they did it. And they're on YouTube. I think it's uh, Star Trek uh, Continues or something like that. I'm just like, for whatever reason, it like creates the uh, dopamine or endorphins of just like, it's 45 minutes. There's a big problem. They solved. It's solved by the end. <laughs> so great. <laughs> well, sometimes happy. it takes an hour and a half to solve it, though. Oh, sometimes, yeah, sometimes. sometimes it's a two-parter, but those are rare. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. It's just like at <laughs> the like end one of it, I'm season. happy. Like I can fall right asleep. Like I just I watched my Star Trek. I'm ready for bed. Anyway, I'm <laughs> totally into it right now. <laughs> yeah, my um. TV watching, like I just can't ever find anything new. I just keep watching, like rewatching all the Star Treks, Buffy mm -hmm. the Vampire Slayer, and um, well, basically anything Joss Whedon did. So like Fireflies. <laughs> uh, uh, there's Dollhouse, which is a super weird, obscure. I remember one. Dollhouse. <laughs> ah, yeah. I watch Dollhouse. I should give it a try. It's <laughs> it's weird. It's, it's weird. very weird. <laughs> it's intriguing. It had though. a short run, which. Yeah. It's probably fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's your what do you have a, a, a particular love of Star Trek, Eric, or just like just loving it right now? No, it's something that I used to love a lot. I just haven't I haven't revisited it in a long time, actually. 
Well, a long time being like four years. Yeah. Like all of college <laughs> took over my life. And then, you know, coming out the other end, it's like, oh yeah, I used to like things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I really enjoy cool. your backdrop. It makes it like it weirdly calms me down. I'm like, all right. Yeah, I've not, I've never, I've, so Love I've it. seen TNG. I've never seen Deep Space Nine or Voyager though. I love Deep Space Nine. It's my favorite. Okay. Yeah. I couldn't get through the first episode of Deep Space Nine. Oh, it's so uh, weird. It's, I, and, and to be fair, first episodes are always difficult. Like they, they have their own, like they're, they have a goal, right? Like, show the producer or like the you know the money people the hook but uh i i I, yeah maybe i'll try it again voyager is excellent (laughs) yeah i'm in i'm in voyager Voyager right now but Uh, i love next generation it's like i have a whole theory about it of like psychology and how we're all like we're all the enterprise and we have all the characters inside of us and we all come to that little table and then like the counselor says her thing and then you know, I was like, number one, he's got his ideas. And then the captain's like, all right, I got it figured out. And then the ship goes. And it's like, I'm the ship. I got all the things. <laughs> it's weird. It's weird. I'm a little too this into it nice. right now. <laughs> the, my, um, I never could really watch the original series, but the, um, the I don't know if you guys are familiar with that um, in Portland. I don't know who did it, but a gr- like a theater troupe did Star Trek in the Park in North I Portland. I, yeah, I only went to one, the last one, actually. Um, I didn't hear about it before that, but yeah, up in, up in St. John's, they, they did, uh, the last one they did was The Trouble with Tribbles. <laughs> yeah, that one's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's good. that was so good. And the Unipiper showed up before the, before it started to play the Star Trek theme song on bagpipes while wearing a Star Trek uniform. <laughs> Amazing. There is an episode in Deep Space Nine where they um, they overdub or film over uh, the Trouble with Tribbles episode um, with the cast of Deep Space Nine participating. It's uh, oh, <laughs> that's I, yeah, funny. that's a good one. I think Deep Space Nine is one of the more creative. Uh, uh, series. It also has some weird like magical stuff in it and some like some, like religious stuff from like the, the, the planet. Like there's some religion in there. Anyway, it's super fascinating. It, there's uh, something from Star Trek. Next to a wormhole. <laughs> there's a Star Trek Discovery episode that actually talks about how the Tribbles were created. Interesting. Well, the, I loved oh, Discovery sure. so much when I started <laughs> Uh, watching it but I we only had like a seven day free trial of yeah. the whatever uh, yeah thing it was on and so I only got through like three or four episodes but it was so good okay so the other thing that I'm kind of like cracking up right now is that I'm recording this meeting and totally forgot to pause it for the- <laughs> <laughs> all the geeks so we're out the it. meeting description is like safe routes to school plus a lot of Star Trek Back on, they're still talking about this. <laughs> on, uh, whether you should watch Star Trek of any type. What are we? Are we all? Are we back now? I'm gonna fill up water really fast, but it's gonna be <laughs> seconds. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> they prove that. <laughs> yeah, I've really I watched Star Trek Picard on CBS, and then the mm. Discovery, and then the little shorts, and. Uh, for Discovery, which I thought worked really, really well. And since you don't have it with Discovery, I forget the name of the officer, but she had a temporary assignment where on a research vessel and one of her science team was coming up with an idea of coming up with a food source. And he totally disobeyed all her orders and created a fast breeding tribble that can be used for food. (laughs) And they had to destroy the ship. That was her first command. (laughs) And they had to destroy the ship. That's okay. That's excellent. That's that is a great origin story. All right. Well, it looks like people are popping back in. Um, thanks for folks who stayed for humoring me. No one in my house wants to talk about Star Trek with me, so that was a little nice. <laughs> Love Star well, now Trek. You know who to call. Watching it. I missed the whole Star Trek conversation. Oh, I think there's a subcommittee to be Any, made. 
Anytime. Anytime. Oh my God, I'm, watching, I'm watching Voyager right now. I'm in Voyager. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, we'll have to talk about it later. Yeah, we will. <laughs> I'll probably pick it up again once I finish with Buffy. Yeah. I just think it's like filling a need of like that that problem solving. It's like there's a big problem, they solve it and everyone's happy. So it's like, oh, endorphins. And they look good doing it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> all right, just a few more minutes. I think folks are coming back at 2.20. Leanne, I just sent you a wee note. Oh, and Leanne, are you, am I just saying ping? Are you managing the PowerPoints? Yes, I'm managing the PowerPoints. And we can be sure to, um, we'll do a, 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 there's a little more about staff in the in the second half of the meeting. So, and, and we've got some folks back in this meeting. So we'll do a quick round of ODOT reintroductions again. So uh, Pipeman, Susan Pipeman, and we'll, um, Oh, and the other ODOT staff, that's what you meant, that we forgot to, to, we didn't have time, we were trying to jump into the meeting. So we'll get to the other ODOT staff that are in the room too, uh, before the second half of the meeting. Um, you want to go ahead and get started on that now, Chris? Should we do it? Uh, why don't we wait till everybody's back? Maybe we got one more minute. Okay. Susan, can you tell us how the meeting's going, the OTC meeting? Man, they are so behind, and I was hoping that Karen right now is talking about the non-highway allocation, and so I've been trying to like toggle back and forth, and I can't like mute this meeting, so it's actually been this like merging of two meetings. Oh, it's annoying, but uh, they, I don't know what's going to happen, and it's going to happen while I'm talking. <laughs> And Leslie, Ann, you want to um, move the agenda real quick on me um, and push me back 10 minutes and somebody forward 10 minutes, and then I'll be able to hear the OTC discussion. And you know, Hannah, I think uh, Hannah I offered to go before you. So do you guys mind if I do that? And then I'll, okay, I'll, I'll, you'll see me when I pop back in. Yeah, text me if there's a problem. Um, thank you, Hannah, for being flexible. The flow won't be great, but Susan will get more information and be able to report back. <laughs> yep. Okay. I'm going to actually bug out. See you guys in a minute. Bye. Let's still go ahead and do the ODOT introductions though. Great. Um, earlier in the meeting, we skipped a couple of ODOT staffers uh, who I am going to call out right now. If you can please just turn your video on for a second and introduce yourself and, um, and uh, your, your, your title at ODOT and, and why you're at this meeting today. Um, we'll start with um, Alan Thompson. Hi everyone, I'm Alan Thompson. I'm the Community Pass Program Manager and which are all the off-road pass and there is a safe rest school element of that. So I'm here to let everyone be aware of that and to make sure that we have a nice little symbiosis. That's all. Alan runs a competitive program kind of similar to the Safe Routes program. And so we're, we're really learning from each other as well as um, we all know that paths are a great solution to getting kids to school. So we anticipate funding some of those great paths as part of um, the Community Paths program. Uh, next, let's go down to Tammy. Hi, I'm Tammy Weil. I am the Safe Routes coordinator. So I do all of the behind the scenes stuff that helps Leanne out. Um, uh, so now we that we have about 70 Safe Routes to School projects around the state, we couldn't do it without folks like Tammy who process all of the intergovernmental agreements, the scoping changes, the quarterly reports, the reimbursement requests, and um, she helps me with some of the logistics of this meeting um, as well and um, isn't part of the, the larger team. Um, that's all the other ODOT staff that's in the room. Um, Tracy Pearl. Uh, has been popping in and out due to also a conflicting um, the the OTC meeting. Uh, I apologize that we scheduled this on the same day. I don't think this this will overlap again. The OTC is the Oregon Transportation Commission, which is like the the big commission that's in charge of all of ODOT. So they make big decisions that affects everybody. So um, we have competing meetings right now. Uh, Tracy Pearl is Heidi Manlove's um, manager uh, in the safety division. And, and so she plays that role in the Safe Routes to School education side of the program, which we'll be talking about in the second half of the meeting. Um, I believe that's everybody that might be possible. Yes. 
We have Jessica Horning. Oh, Jessica, are you on? Hey. Yeah, I'm I'm just lurking. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Jessica Horning. I'm ODOT's pedestrian and bicycle program manager. So I manage a pot of funding for uh, walking and biking improvements on or along state highways. Um, and I also staff our state bicycle and pedestrian advisory committee. So I just uh, have you guys on in the background and I'm trying to follow along while I do some other stuff. So thanks for letting me lurk. Hey, Jess. All right, I will share my screen one more time <coughs> and I will skip over all of Susan's Great slides. Don't get freaked out. She can do that quickly. And we'll move on to um, Hannah uh, to tell us a little bit about the education work that Alta Planning and Design is helping us with this year. Great. Can everyone hear me okay? Fantastic. Well, thanks so much, Leanne, and thank you, everyone. We are very thrilled to be joining you all as the official ODOT Safe Rights of School Technical Assistance Team. And um, we refer to our, ourselves as the consultant team that is um, providing additional support for communities, both grantees and throughout the, the state. And I'll talk more about what that means. Um, we refer to ourselves as the TAPS or the technical service providers, technical, uh, technical assistance providers. Um, and we are also planning and design, community options, the street trust and uh, Cogito. And we've all been involved in Safe, Oregon's Safe Routes to School program in similar ways in the past, but this new contract really um, changes how the consultant team comes together, provides a more unified team that we're able to provide services to ODOT and work closely with Leanne and Heidi. So next slide, I wanted to share um, how we all work together. And so if you're seeing some of, uh, some of the different groups um, within the TAPS, um, we have a better sense of, of who's doing what on our team. So um, at the top, you can see Leanne and Heidi are the co-program managers and they are our clients on this. Um, as the lead consultant, Alta Planning and Design, we're doing the program management and coordinating all of the sub-consultants on the team. We, Alta, it's an active transportation company. We're dedicated to creating active, healthy communities and our Portland-based team uh, works on statewide, regional, local safe routes to school efforts throughout Oregon and the U.S. And so we have been leading the project identification program for the last, uh, I believe it's two years. And I've actually presented to the SRAC previously um, on, on some updates on the project identification program. We're leading the um, safe routes to school strategy that we'll be talking about later um, in this meeting. And we are uh, continuing to lead evaluation activities and contributing to the education or the non-infrastructure program. And then I am the, um, Hannah de Capel, I'm the project manager and so provide oversight over all the activities. So um, I'm sort of the, the main point of contact for the team. So um, we're joined with Community Options, which is based in Bend and they lead work on um, education um, as they have in the past. They've been doing the communications activities like the Oregon State Press School website, the newsletter, and coordination between the grantees on the non-infrastructure side. I think you're all familiar at this point with Brian Potwind, who's the, the executive director, and he also serves on the SRAC. Um, and then we're recently joined with Samantha Bork, uh, who hopefully you'll have an opportunity to get to know. We're also working with the Street Trust, which is based in Portland, and they um, also uh, work on the education programming, particularly around walk and roll challenge activities and trainings and the recognition program. And then as we're working on the strategy, all of our organizations will be involved with re-envisioning re the structure of the education program and planning support and all of those pieces that we'll be talking about. And of course, you know, Chris, um, she, her work actually facilitating the um, these SRAC meetings are part of the contract that we have. Um, she's also going to be helping us with the strategy. So um, we will be coming to you um, throughout, I think most of the meetings coming up to provide some updates on our work and to provide some background as well. 
Um, and then we, of course, work closely with both the Oregon State Front School Network and the Leadership Committee. So next slide. I wanted to provide a timeline of the contract activities. We are, um, so we, our contract kicked off in October of this year and we have been kind of continuing the services, trying to provide a, you know, just a feeling of continuity with previous work. And then we're also doing a Safe Arts and School strategy that we'll be talking about, like I said. Um, we are drafting that this month and then in, to the, um, well, the plan is to draft it by the, uh, in February, and then we're going to be developing work plans that come out of the strategy that are really guiding our work on the consultant team through September, 2022. The internal strategy, it's not planned to be an, a formally adopted program, um, but it's gonna be really a roadmap for the team, for both, for particularly the consultant team, but also staff. And it's also going to guide kind of how we're working with outside um, stakeholders and other Safe Rest School practitioners. So we're really going to be developing the strategy, developing our work plans, and then piloting some new approaches on the education side um, through the next 18 months or so. And then we'll be revising the strategy based on what um, we've heard and how the pilots are going and finalizing it at that point. So we really look forward to working with um, the, the SRAC over the time and getting all of your feedback and guidance on the strategy in just a little bit today. Hey, so, yeah. oh, I'm yeah. sorry, before we dive into this, could you just for folks who may not be as versed in the network and the partnership, could you describe what those are in Oregon? Absolutely, sorry, I did not. Um, so the Safe Rest of School Leadership Committee is undergoing a bit of a, a change currently, but um, Noelle, who is also um, on the SRAC, is one of the co-chairs along with Janice from um, City of Portland Safe Rest of School Program. Um, and it is, the Leadership Committee is really a group of volunteer Safe Rest of School provide, um, practitioners who provide guidance and also support and collaboration for Safe Rest of School activities across the state. And so that's been a really key way of getting practitioners together to share their experiences, share what they're working on, um, learn from each other. And the ODOT Safe Rest of School Program, the TAPS, have been supporting that administratively, as well as all of us are, are also on the uh, committee. Um, and so we're looking for how we're, we're looking to really formalize how we're going to be supporting that group moving forward. And the Oregon Safe Rest of School Network is really just a formal name for anyone who's interested in Safe Rest of Schools throughout the state. It's not a formal group. We kind of define it as the people who've signed up for our newsletter. A sort of a, a like a hard example of what, how this has worked in the past is like the Safe Rest of School Leadership Committee has organized a statewide summit for anyone interested in Safe Rest of School. ODOT maybe provides a little bit of funding to, to help buy lunch. And then anybody doing Safe Rouse to School work comes together and everybody gets to share their challenges and best practices. And an example of something that comes out of that is one year, I believe Zhao actually came and gave us a really big, great story about how they were leading a walking school bus for students walking together to school. And one of their events was to have a puppy day where they brought puppies to the walking school bus and surprise, it was the most popular walking school bus ever. And uh, so that's like an example of of how some of those pieces fit together, how ODOT generally fit, has fit in in the past and what people kind of come away with from after meeting all together is generally just like some new ideas, feeling excited and also like feeling like you're not alone that the challenges that you're facing are the challenges that other people are facing as well. And while we're on the slide, I also wanted to mention that there is a TBD on the bottom right that um, one of the key outcomes of the strategy is going to be um, identifying some next steps around equity. And we are, we have um, a lot of experience among the team on equity approaches to Safe Routes to School, but we also want to acknowledge that there's an opportunity to identify new partners that we would want to bring onto the team, particularly around equity, um, who either represent different um, groups within Oregon or different locations as well. Um, and so that's definitely something that we're looking into is, is what other players we might want to bring 
onto the team as, as tabs. It looks as though Susan's back on um, Zooms. Susan, are you? I'm here. Back and ready. Okay, great. I'm gonna go back to the beginning of your slide deck. There it is. Circle back to Heidi after we're after Susan presents. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I am. There we go. Hi guys. Um, good to see everyone. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Susan Peisman and I am the Strategic Investments Manager in the Public Transportation Division. So a good chunk of my job um, includes a lot of spinning plates and keeping things going, but it also includes money. So I'm here to talk to you guys about money. And um, we just, I have been kind of flipping back and forth between this and the Oregon Transportation Commission meeting, which they didn't exactly, they didn't come to a decision, but they weren't supposed to come to a decision, but they didn't uh, say that we had to halt the process. So we are able to proceed forward. So I, I'm able to kind of give you a little bit more context here. So next slide. So I'm here to talk about 24 to 27 STIP. So the STIP is basically kind of where all of our federal dollars live and we bucket it, next slide. Um, we, it's our capital improvement program. So it's where all the federally funded money lives. So there's not exactly like this isn't where the Safe Routes to School um, House Bill 2017 dollars that um, the infrastructure dollars that you guys allocate lives. However, we like create a line item in there for like transparency, but we don't actually have to put the projects in the SIP, which is a good thing because we have a lot of process for kind of federal projects. Um, so, but there's five major buckets within the SIP. So um, Fix it, enhance safety, non-highway, which is where all of the bike, ped, and transit projects um, live, or funding lives, I should say, and local government. Next slide. Um, so most basically, the Oregon Transportation Commission has authority over a lot of the discretionary federal dollars in the STIP. And so we've just gone through a process for the 24 to 27 STIP, which we actually start getting rolling on in terms of project development in like the summer of 2021. So it's, we do a kind of a three-year project development process before the steps are the time frame for the step. Um, and so they've just gone through a decision-making process on how much money to put in those buckets. And then the public transportation division has gone through a process with stakeholders to um, identify what those sub allocations are. So I'm just gonna walk through those with you guys right now. Um, so on January 6th, we had a, a meeting with the representatives from the advisory committees that the public transportation division oversees. That includes the Oregon Bike Pet Advisory Committee, the Public Transportation Advisory Committee, the Rail Advisory Committee, um, and then Representative Mavis was our representative from the, uh, from the SRAC. Um, and then we also had a representative from um, to go transportation options group of Oregon. Um, so we worked through kind of what the, uh, our staff recommendations were, got a bunch of feedback, made some adjustments. But um, looking the feedback that we had gotten from advisory committees previously, including yourself, was an increase in infrastructure funding for active transportation and safe routes to school, increased funding for non-infrastructure programs such as safe routes to school education focus on climate and social equity, return of local grant programs for active transportation projects and support for investments in like our fix it program. So kind of the, the philosophy, the, the policy direction of fix it first for kind of our non-highway funding. Next slide. So in December, um, the Oregon Transportation Commission uh, decided to increase the uh, funding within non-highway by about $100 million. So, um, that's a huge increase. And so we kind of were working with this $255 million mark for um, the sub allocations. Next slide. Um, so more than $100 million will the focus kind of being on enhanced equity and provide more multimodal travel options. Next slide. Next slide. Um, next slide. I'm going to skip that one for time. So as I mentioned, we had a discussion with the advisory committee representatives on January 6th. Um, we also, there's also a significant amount of feedback to the Oregon Transportation Commission and their decision making. So we included that in our staff recommendations. Looked at the needs from the modal plans. Um, the or ODOT just adopted a strategic action plan also. 
Um, and then kind of a look at what our program managers can handle because with more money, we actually don't get more staff, which is kind of a bummer. Um, and next slide. So wanted to talk about some of the things that are a little, that would be changing and before I get to actually the breakdown of the numbers. So uh, from 20, the, the framing that we had previously was the step for 21 to 24. So that was kind of what we're working, like what's kind of getting delivered now, like until 2024. Um, we had a fund for active transportation leverage and we've actually, that was, um, I won't go into the details on that one for time, but we actually cut that program and I'll show you where that money went. Um, what we have done, we have a couple new programs, including um, a, a bike ped strategic, which is a focus on um, a pedestrian bicycle infrastructure on the state system on fe using federal funds and ODOT safe routes to school infrastructure. So if you zoned out with me talking about money right now, I want you to pay attention. So what we're proposing and what we're moving forward with, um, with commission support is, is actually taking ODOT out of the safe routes to school competition and paying for those projects with the safe routes to school infrastructure funds. So saying we're better at delivering federal dollars. Um, why don't we make more easily deliverable like state dollars? State dollars are easy, easier for local agencies to spend. Why don't we make more state dollars available to local agencies and we'll fund the ODOT projects separately in um, over here using federal dollars and then more money will be available for local agencies in the state competition. So does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Um, looking at some money for uh, some additional money for transit. Um, so kind of our intended outcomes being more money for local agencies and climate impacts and then um, an equity lens, it will be applied to kind of our fund, all of our funding distribution. Next slide. So here's some of the numbers. Um, this may or may not make sense to you. It's kind of how entrenched you are on the ODOT finance piece. Um, but uh, some of the, I mentioned we are zeroing out our leverage pot. We have to, by law, spend 1% of our state gas tax dollars on bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. So that's kind of that 1% requi required line there in gray. We have done something. We've um, increased the money that we had for the um, Oregon Community Paths Program. Um, that uh, which is a competition for local agencies for um, off, off system, off street, or um, bicycle and pedestrian facilities and connections. And we're looking at kind of expanding um, the policy direction of that for just kind of enhanced protected um, uh, facilities as well. So uh, basically, we're plussing up the community pass program by about um, six times its current amount. So that's good news. Um, and then we're looking at this bike ped strategic money um, to address uh, like sidewalk infill crossing needs um, and bicycle facilities on the state system at 45 million. Next slide. Um, I mentioned, so we have kind of a line item there on the House Bill 2017 infrastructure money. That's the money that you guys would be um, allocating for 24 to 27, that's 45 million, but Leanne might be cutting that differently for kind of the, the, the cycles of the competition. Um, Safe routes to school education. So that's the Heidi Manlove managed program, increasing that from 3 million to 4 million. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, um, the Safe routes to school ODOT infrastructure at 10 million. So, and that 10 million will be used to pull us out of the, um, the competition and making more money for local agencies. Next slide. I'm gonna pause for one second. Um, Danny asked, uh, would shifting the ODOT projects to a separate pot include eliminating locally driven projects on ODOT roads or would that remain in the state competitive pool? Um, uh, local agencies can submit projects for, uh, for ODOT roads and that would still be allowable in the Safe Routes to School program. Next slide. That's a great question. Um, then for our public transportation funding, looking at increasing our kind of our mass transit pot, um, it's a distribution to transit agencies around the state, increasing our elderly and disabled um, allocation from 37 to 50 million. Um, and then uh, transit vehicle replacement, um, which is with a focus on how do we incentivize electrification of the transit fleet. Next slide. And then with transportation options, um, so looking at increasing that pot 
to seven and a half million. So um, it looks like this huge jump, but it's actually our full budget for that's like 5.5. So just trust me, it's a $2 million jump. And um, the reason for that um, increase uh, for transportation options is with uh, the governor's executive order um, around greenhouse gas reduction, um, looking at uh, the, the most likely um, implementation of a statewide eco rule um, to, for employers to in, statewide work for employers to encourage um, people to drive less. So next slide. Uh, and then we just, we had a million dollars for passenger rail um, facility planning. Next slide. And so what I just was trying to listen to, um, the, our division administrator, Karen Criswell, was just at the Oregon Transportation Commission. Um, it's, it's not generally these sub allocations that I just described to you. The OTC usually allocates like the big pots, those big buckets. Um, but the sub allocations tend to be an agency um, it, at the agency's discretion. However, um, the OTC can always say, no, no, we want to make that decision. And so we were showing them our staff recommendations uh, just now and got positive feedback. So we're proceeding forward um, with what you just saw. So um, at this point, you can consider those, um, you can consider that we'll have a $10 million um, ODOT Safe Routes to School program, pulling ourselves out of the competition and increase in a million dollars for the Safe Routes to School Education Program um, and uh, going up to $36 million. Um, and we'll probably find some more money to add to plus up um, the Community Paths Program, which is the competition for local agencies. Next, next slide. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Um, thank you very much, uh, Susan. And um, I think that one of the, like what Susan's talking about, it, it's um, Heidi and I's goal for the past year has been trying to set safe routes to school up so that we can grow so that when there is additional funding that comes our way in situations like this, we have created a program that is easily scalable and phaseable. And um, since Susan also mentioned that it doesn't uh, generally doesn't increase staff whenever programs grow um, or traditionally we have really been uh, working with Alta to try to create a sort of contract system to where we can we can create a, a structure and a base for our programs that 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 will be able to grow when these types of decisions are being made um, so we're really excited about the education program and some of the things that we're thinking about now are really to try to set it up so that we can incorporate more funding down the line. Um, with that, uh, can I, can I interrupt? Uh, Mavis, can I ask Mavis if she has anything to add? She was around the table for the um, January 6th meeting with the advisory committee representative. I, I think that uh, you're very well informed. Good job. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, no, I mean, I'm excited about that much funding coming towards towards walking and biking. So I'm stoked. I am a little leery about breaking the stuff up, but I understand that there's other reasons. Um, as I was telling a couple of other people, I really like the designation of uh, Safe Routes to School because it really resonates with like the acts and a few other people that to kick many that way because it's such a, a warm and fuzzy. But yeah. Um, I don't see any uh, questions in the chat and we have a tight agenda for the last um, bit, but it looks like we do have a Rob Innerfeld hand up. Chris, can we take a couple of questions now? Yeah, right, go for it, Rob. You know, just one thing I wanna ask is, is there any funding for Safe Routes to School projects that are not in the right of way? That, you know, will any of these programs be, because that's one of the real, significant limitations of the grant program that we have now. Yeah, it would be the community pass program. Um, okay. And something in terms of engaging with that. Um, and so that's that uh, 36 million of off systems. So Rob, that's also the place we'll be taking if there ever is any Connect Oregon money, we'll be like putting the Connect Oregon money there. It's also where mm -hmm. the bike tax goes. Um, and so uh, something that it's totally appropriate from an SRAC um, from my perspective, it's totally appropriate for SRAP to engage um, and, you know, if you, if you feel as though strongly that um, safer to school criteria should be included in some way for that community paths program, it's totally appropriate to make that 
comment or write that letter or something as we're mm -hmm. going through the development of the next round of the community yeah. path program. I mean, if you could check in with us at the right time on that, that would be great. And then just a quick observation is that, well, two things. One is that this step covers a three year period, even though it seems like it's four years. So I just, I, I didn't realize that until recently. So I wanna make yeah. sure people are aware of that, which is great because it means more money per year. Yeah, three when, years. When you, when you total up the funding for ODOT facilities and non and no, non ODOT facilities, it works out to like around 80 million each mm -hmm. and not, not, including, not including the public transportation. And so, you know, I just kind of think to myself, like, is that the right, and I know the OTC kind of blessed that today, but is that the right mix? Like, if you think about the charge from the governor to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from transportation, I would guess that, mo you know, most people, when they leave their house, they're not about to walk on an ODOT street. And so if we're trying to get people to walk and bike more or walk to the bus, I would think that we would want to invest more in local communities and not on the ODOT facilities. It's just a thought. And yeah. I mean, of course, there's other funds available through MPOs and that sort of thing. So this isn't everything. And, and we definitely, just to answer that, we definitely have kind of gone through that, that policy discussion for sure. Um, we are also trying to take it from a statewide perspective. Like there are like, for example, region four and five main streets tend to be a lot of ODOT facilities. Um, and the ODOT network is only at about 45% completion right now. The other thing that I think that we can do with the ODOT money to really help support local communities is really focus the funds on crossing, like crossings, bundling a lot of crossings. Um, because yeah, people don't, <laughs> don't and for good reasons want to walk and bike on the state system in a lot of places but they need to get across it so thanks yeah no rob i always appreciate your perspective on this um thank you guys for letting me share this information with you um really appreciate the engagement that you had on the step earlier um in the fall i think that helps a lot so this is just trying to demonstrate some of the impacts of your letters and engagement. Uh, Susan, just a quick question uh, to Rob's point about at what time would they uh, engage back in on the community paths program? Mm -hmm. do, you have a, do you have a ballpark? Well, Alan's just getting applications for this round now. Um, I think we'll have to decide whether or not we split that month, that if we can split it into like a two year cycle or something like that, you know? Um, and so if we're, we're able to split it into a two year cycle, I, I imagine like we'd absolutely need to get the development of any program changes within the next year. So if you, I would just put it on the 2021 planning calendar for checking in with us on when it would be appropriate to engage on any sort of criteria changes. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the SRAC? Well done toggling between two, two meetings and doing a presentation as well, Susan. No problem. I guess that's the beauty of virtual meetings. I don't know. Blessing of the curse. Being two places at once. Okay. Thank you. Bye. All right. So we're going to circle back now to Heidi to talk about um, what the SRAC uh, focus will be uh, for 2021. Yeah, um, this is a tough act to follow from Susan's great news and uh, Alta uh, uh, introducing themselves with this, uh, with our joint advisory, um, I mean, sorry, joint uh, um, uh, technical assistance. Um, so both of those presentations kind of lead to um, our goals of this year uh, in terms of the SRAC work plan. Um, so Hannah, um, kind of talked a little bit about um, the ODOT uh, um, work plan. And so to, today I'm just gonna give a brief summary of some of the things to look forward to, the exciting stuff we're working on this year with you guys. Um, so, so I'm excited um, because we get, this gives us a chance to take a deep dive into the education side um, and really think about uh, how the funding structure is set up and um, so we'll be going over planning for the next um, competitive funding, which, as you heard, it's likely that I will um, be receiving um, more funds on the side of um, safe routes for for grants. Um, also, uh, thinking about our new uh, joint technical assistance um, and talking about how this can be more streamlined into into the work uh, for both Leanne and my program. 
Um, so we'll be reviewing the current funding cycles and then ask, discussing with you um, and asking some recommendations on the next funding program splits and how we set this up. Next slide. So that's a general breakdown of the kinds of things we'll be working on um, in the next uh, few months. Um, a little more explicitly, um, this gives us this opportunity to expand um, the Safe Routes education side um, in ways that um, it's never been uh, able to before um, because of lack of funding. Um, so I think it's time for us to look at the current program structure um, and do it at a time in between these funding cycles where we can really change things up um, and do some really, really, really amazing things. Uh, so Leanne and I have done some uh, forecasting of what we would like to do and some brainstorming um, and taken some things that lessons learned um, that I have taken along the road from the last funding cycle, this current funding cycle, and what I'd like to see in the next funding cycle. Um, and then also uh, start to think about how we can review the diversity of statewide needs, not just geographically or through social equity, um, but even just where people are in their Safe Routes to School journey. Um, we have people that are just beginning Safe Routes and just starting to kind of talk about it and think about it and plan for it. And then we have ones that have been skyrocketing for many years and they are on a different level. So um, taking that into consideration. Um, and so during all this, we'll be talking about challenges and barriers to um, being able to, to bounce um, bounce with all these different uh, bubbles going um, to try to get the best bang for our buck. Um, next slide. So the kinds of questions um, that we'll be asking are, um, what is possible to meet all of these needs, diversity of needs in the state? Um, how can we expand access to fund projects equitably? Um, ways that we thought were equitable before, um, how could we do this better? Um, how can we also utilize our expanding technical assistance in ways to help folks um, um, prioritize and plan um, grant applications? Um, and how can we do all this to maximize resources? Um, what are the kinds of things we're looking to do the most good? Next slide. Uh, so, so what is your role this year? Um, it's basically helping us to be better. Um, so we're gonna ask you to offer solutions um, to these challenges and barriers, offer solutions to uh, the program structure, the funding structure, um, how Leanne and I collaborate, but also how we collaborate with partners, um, how we work with our technical assistants. Um, we'll be asking you to recommend funding priorities uh, to, to TSD and so my transportation safety division and then um, and then my um, safety division also has a committee um, that's the Oregon Transport Transportation Safety Committee and they also help um, make funding recommendations as well. Um, we'll also be asking you to recommend a scoring matrix for the next competitive round um, and also to possibly a scoring matrix for a competitive round of services such as a, a consultant mini grant program, let's say. Um, next slide. So this is a brief overview of uh, what we have to look forward to, um, dig our, to dig our heels into this year. Um, so th this next meeting uh, on March 18th, I'll talk a little bit more about that um, toward the end. Um, but the meetings after, the next meeting will kind of be a overview of the Safe Routes to School education program and kind of what my barriers and challenges are. Um, and then the three meetings after that will be kind of, getting some decisions and some recommendations from you all. Um, so toward the end of the year, we'll be set up for the next round of funding and start thinking about um, what we could possibly do with extra funding. Next slide. That's it. Yep. Any questions about uh, the 2021 work plan from the SRAC? I'll go back because one, ah. Gosh, darn it. 
Um, uh, one thing that's new on this that I haven't quite sent y'all an invitation for yet is this optional travel meeting. Um, last year we decided that it would be really fun to go visit a completed Safe Routes to School project and maybe visit a Safe Routes to School education program. Um, so we have some tentative dates for that travel meeting that I'll be able to send around for you all to put a hold on your calendars, but that's assuming travel is okay. And um, and it's an optional, there won't be any decisions made. It will just be a, a time for us all to hopefully get together and to learn about what, what, what we're actually accomplishing and see it and touch it. I don't see any questions in the chat. If anybody has anything, just go ahead and raise your hand or pop it in there. Heidi, when do you, I have a question. When, um, with this new funding coming in, I know the decision's not quite made, but with this new funding coming in, um, when are you thinking that discussion about how to program that might be, I know it's a few years off, or are you thinking that this will provide some baseline? Actually, that will be the next round of funding. Um, if we're getting the money 24 through 27 step, that will involve this next round of funding. So potentially we'll have bigger buckets to work with. Um, and so, yeah, this is this is now. <laughs> um, so we're we're doing this in enough time before the next round of funding to to really plot that out and um, and and think about this expansion. Excellent, great. Mm -hmm. Thank you for clarifying that. Yep. Okay. It, before we dive into the um, overall program direction, which this is all kind of leading to our discussion. Um, any questions for Heidi? Uh, before we dive into this, just one, I have a, one quick question because I'm curious if anybody's heard anything with the new transportation secretary um, coming into the Biden administration. Is there any swirling rumors or thoughts about um, increased funding for safe routes or active transportation in general? And I know it's only been the first full day. So <laughs> I might be uh, a little anxious or um, uh, excited about this, but I was just curious. Talking a lot about trains. Mm -hmm. Loves trains. <laughs> Mayor Pete, <I'm, laughs> I think it's mm -hmm. gonna be, it's gonna be hilarious and and i'm i'm super stoked about it i don't have any gossip though okay i believe that the safe routes partnership was working with a consortium of different transportation folks to put together a package that was was considering safe routes to school as part of uh for their transportation or stimulus bill yeah yeah the transportation package is going to expire real soon so um we need to do another one then with uh representative defazio on ways and means chair i think he is it's the really great there. Um, the Oregon Transportation Commission was just kind of like talking about stimulus. <laughs> so, but I don't, I think, I don't know if they're, I'm hesitant to count egg chickens before they hatch. So uh, That's something certainly to keep tracking. Yeah. Okay. Um, Hannah, do you want to lead us off on this exciting discussion? Yeah. So I know that this has been a lot of information, um, and especially for the new folks, thanks for bearing with all of this. Um, but soon we will be asking for your feedback quickly. Um, you've already seen the slide, why well, I wanted to remind um, and set the scene for this um, next activity. Um, this is the timeline of the, the program, kind of the next couple of years that we are writing this ODOT Safe Routes to School strategy. And then from the strategy, we're gonna be developing uh, work plans that will guide our work over, our being, sorry, the consultant team's work over the next 18-ish months. Um, and we'll also be defining actions and um, strat goals, strategies, and actions that will be looking forward to a three to five year time horizon. So it's a pretty short term strategy. It's also, like I said, it's not going to be adopted and then it's very important that this is the ODOT Safe Routes to School strategy. We're not trying to create a strategy that's comprehensive across the, the um, state. It's not the Oregon Safe Routes to School strategy. It's really a, thinking about the ODOT program and the place in, within the um, network of, of practitioners and the activities and, and key deliverables and things that are being produced by ODOT staff 
and the consultant team. So um, next slide. In order to develop this Safe Rest of School strategy, we in um, October, November, and December, we've done some uh, outreach. And there were three main categories of outreach that we did. You can see on the slide, a questionnaire, focus groups, and one-on-one -on -one interviews. Um, hopefully you all got the email about the questionnaire. We're able to fill that out. And I know that several of you were part of the focus groups and the interviews that we did. Um, across all of those data collection uh, methods, we were really focusing on getting feedback on what's working well with the program, what the challenges that um, Safe Routes School practitioners and advocates and other partners are facing, and then what do our partners need to advance Safe Routes School more in their own communities and their agencies. So we uh, worked with um, Safe Routes School and active education professionals. Um, we had a lot of phone interviews and we're not meeting in person. Um, and we got um, on this flag that we had 132 responses on the questionnaire, which felt pretty good for um, really targeting Safe Routes School professionals. Mm -hmm. um, and we had um, a number of one-on-one -on -one interviews that were really focused on internal um, ODOT and statewide stakeholders. So OD, um, the uh, Department of Education and the, the health, um, Oregon Health Authority. So I wanted to talk about some um, of the key themes that we heard in all of this feedback. So um, one thing that kept coming up was that stakeholders would like to see more investments in infrastructure, that there's a clear need for a safer infrastructure and, um, and really feeling like education is hard to do if uh, it, the community feels that walking and biking environment feels unsafe. So often it's the infrastructure that needs to happen before um, communities feel like they can take on the education component. We also heard clearly that there's a mandate to reach underserved communities across the state, specifically black, indigenous, and communities of color along with the rural communities in the state. Um, the PIP, we got the feedback that the PIP does this pretty well for construction projects. Um, but like uh, Heidi alluded to, it seems like there's a lot of opportunities to expand it to more education programming to really set up communities so that they can apply for the education funding and really like hit the ground running and know what they're going to be doing with it once they receive that funding. And the PIP is that project identification Sorry. program that sometimes we call PIP, but it is planning assistance that we can send Alta out to a community and help them address, uh, uh, write a safe routes to school plan. Great, thank you. Sorry. Um, there's also, um, we're, you know, there's the the grant is really well designed to fund the the. Um, greatest diversity of communities and the most underserved communities, looking at Title I and other factors, but there's also opportunities to look at who's not applying to the grants. Um, I think we talked about earlier about communities that don't just don't have the resources to even uh, write a grant. So there may be some opportunities there. We also see opportunities to grow and strengthen and leverage existing partnerships. Um, knowing that there's this expanded funding and interest in Safe Routes of School at the state level and, and um, in regional levels and a lot of um, community levels, it's a good time to build awareness of Safe Routes of School, um, particularly within other um, departments at ODOT um, and with the Health Authority and um, the education, um, getting into elementary um, districts getting into like moving past the statewide level and into more of the operational and um, uh, the level where people are at, could actually like provide education or really um, help make things happen. We also heard from Safe Routes to School practitioners that they're very interested in getting more educational and encouragement resources, um, which has always been a core component of the statewide program. Um, we heard some of the suggestions were about having stipends or having ways of really formally partnering with community-based organizations and teachers and community members. And so that's part of the reason there's that TBD um, in terms of the equity um, TAC or technical assistance provider, knowing that there's a desire to be able to have some, some mechanism for more easily taking advantage uh, or like working collaboratively with 
um, other groups within the community who might be interested in doing Safe Heads of School, but may be hard to contract with or hard to find funding for. Um, we heard that materials accessibility and resource accessibility was really important. Um, not enough of our materials are available in Spanish or other languages that are spoken by Oregonians. And there's a great opportunity for creating more culturally and community relevant materials. Uh, another category under this heading is accept more accessible documents. So things that would support digital readers or um, considering physical ability and cultural dress in bike and head safety lessons. Now we also heard um, a lot of support for trainings and, and capacity building for practitioners and that um, people, the, the Safe Routes community didn't really care where the funding came from, but that felt like the ODOT Safe Routes to School program should really be supporting Safe Routes to School practitioners and, and community members regardless of where, where their funding comes from. So really supporting the network or supporting other, other efforts to build that community of Safe Routes to School practitioners and providing the technical assistance and capacity building so that everyone can do better and reach more people um, throughout the state. And then finally, um, developing more transparent communications processes. So really communicating what ODOT's doing and also clarifying kind of what ODOT's role is compared to Metro's role or the partnership's role or the network's role. And so being very clear on who's doing what and having a, a sort of one-stop shop for, for the different um, uh, aspects of the, the program as it grows. So that was a lot, but. Um, and we're, we're going to get your feedback in a moment, but I just want to um, outline what the where we're going with this. So the strategy we're envisioning, it's going to be a pretty short document. We certainly got enough feedback that we could have a much long, longer uh, tome, but we really want to keep this high level. We want to keep it useful for guiding our work and ODOT staff's work and for um, communicating with um, you all and the SRAC and other partners about what ODOT's role is and how to build up other partnerships and collaboration opportunities across the state. So we're going to be, um, we're, we're like aiming for about 20 pages, we'll see how that goes, um, but really identifying a vision. Um, we really like the guiding principles that, that um, Chris spoke about earlier, the SRAC guiding principles and um, are likely to to use those as, as the sort of frame of how we're thinking about the vision and goals um, of the program. We're also going to be thinking about evaluation, what metrics can be tracked across the state, um, as well as performance measures that are, you know, indicators of how well we're doing. So we can do, be, be uh, very clearly indicate what um, the success of the program or, and where there are opportunities. And then we're really keeping like the specific actions. We're not getting into the weeds on like how we're actually going to do all of this. That's what's going to go into the work plan. So in all of the, the feedback that we've gotten, we have our virtual sticky note board and um, everything's really, the feedback we've gotten is really coalesced into those four main, what we're calling goal areas for now. And what we, the direction that we are, seeing is that we're going to be def defining a goal or a couple of goals in each of these areas. And this is what we're, where we're going to ask for your feedback today. So quickly to go through what these are, um, I think most of them are pretty self-explanatory, but funding and grants, the, obviously the key function of the ODOT Safe Routes to School program. Um, we heard that communities would really like more guidance and support for applying for grants and flexibility in funding, especially in the non-infrastructure where um, folks re reported feeling kind of that there was, they either were part of the program or they were kind of shut out because of these three year grant cycle for the education programming. Internal ODOT coordination is really about considering how Safe Rest School staff can work more collaboratively or get more involved in active transportation work in transit and in travel options, uh, tr transportation options as well as other um, groups that have other, you know, there's a lot of common goals and funding opportunities that Safe Routes School could um, could use and take advantage of. Um, sorry for the acronym SOUP for <laughs> external coordination, 
but um, we have the Oregon Department of Education, the Oregon Health Authority, the Department of Land, Land Conservation. I should know this. DLCD. I don't know. Land, land, conservation, land conservation something. And development. And development. And development. That's it. Nailed it. <laughs> And then the um, Oregon St. Francis School Network, which is really, like I said, the community of St. Francis School practitioners across the state. And we've been working with Noel, um, who's the co-chair and the network to support coordination and training in that, um, on that. Um, and actually the SRAC would go under the um, external coordination partnerships. And then finally, the training communications and outreach materials and that, that's sort of a working title, but it's really about building capacity of practitioners across the state providing materials. Um, and then we also have been envisioning kind of a, a shift. Um, our new contract structure enables us to, to really work more collaboratively across different, across um, infrastructure and non-infrastructure, construction and education, um, and also within the different elements of the education. And so really thinking about more of a like hub model um, there's an opportunity for us to provide additional services and support at a more sort of granular, granular regional level. Um, and so we're exploring what that might look like um, as, in addition to all of the statewide work that we're doing. And um, so Chris sent out a survey to you all um, to get some initial feedback on these goal areas. And the next slide shows the um, summary of what we heard um, and just quickly um, I think this is all pretty similar to what I've talked about before um, but on funding and grants definitely having more funding for education and flexible flexibility in the funding came up again um, for internal ODOT coordination um, there was definitely some some questions about um, what this means and, and desire for more information about what internal ODOT coordination looks like or how that could, could work. Um, for external coordination partnerships, um, really leleveraging interagency fund, uh, funding came up um, and just like growing the awareness and knowledge of St. Francis School in the community. And then under training communications and materials, growing the online resource center, um, bringing the SRAC in more to reviewing materials um, and exploring like flexible funding and stipends. So that's the quick uh, download on what we heard. And um, I wanted to, so we're gonna move into the um, breakout sessions and we have some questions for you. And as we're thinking about what the um, next steps are. We're breaking it into the next two years and the next, and then three to five years. So I just wanted to clarify like what the obligations of the program over the next two years. So through the end of 2022, or sorry, through 2023. Um, so all of the technical assistance that we've been talking about, that's all ongoing. Um, but the plan as it stands now is that there would be a competitive construction grant call for projects at, as well as additional funding for project identification programming in spring 2022. And then the next cycle for the competitive education grant would be in spring 2023. So that's kind of the, the pieces that we are more tied to and then everything else is, is up for conversation. So with that, if there are any questions. I just have a clarification question. I think as we go into these small breakout uh, groups and they'll be facilitated by Hannah, um, Leanne, uh, I'll facilitate one and Kaylin. Uh, no, I'm Katie. Sorry. Katie. Katie will be facilitating. Um, so they're giving feedback areas on these goal areas on education and construction. Yes, the, the strategies really bring in, actually we intentionally are not um, pulling us apart education and construction in these goal areas. They're really, we're trying to really marry the two sides of the program together throughout. Excellent. Okay, so we're gonna take just to uh, finally that we're done talking and I know it's a, it's a wave of information that you are awashed in um, that we're breaking out into these small uh, groups 
and we're just going to talk about are we missing anything from your ideas in these categories and then two to three years coming as as Hannah just showed what do you think we should focus on what are the priorities right now and you'll have an opportunity to review this again um, so with that Kaylin actually let me pause are there any questions about what we're about to just dive into we've got about 10 minutes and then we're going to report out as a group and I think that'll spark some more uh, uh, interesting conversation. Quick question. Um, will we be able to see this slide in the breakout rooms? Yeah. Yes. Okay, great. Um, actually, uh, it's slightly more complicated than that. You will be able to see that slide if you show it. So you'll, uh, since you're leading one of the discussions um, in that annotated agenda that I, that I sent you, the, there, this slide is copied and pasted into that annotated agenda. Wow. Um, I can also That's copy so and paste it into that online notes document that you have to make sure that you have it. So just let me know. Oh, I've got it. I've got it. Oh, she's got it. Great. Great. All right. Okay. So, uh, Kaylin, would you do your magic? And it's random who's going into uh, what group? Correct. All right. 10 minutes. Let's head on in. All right. Thank you. It is three. Hi, Leanne. Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm just checking every time we flip to the different spots. So I know this my this screen always shows up. Oh, anyway, I'm surrounded <laughs> by screens. This is really quite funny. Okay, so I get to facilitate this group. Hello, everybody. Hello, hello. 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 Um uh let's do um let's do since um since Eric's new to our committee. Hi, Tracy. Let's do a quick round of just like your name again and where you're from. And then we'll jump into these uh, questions that I can I can share my screen and show y'all. Um, Eric, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, sure. Hello, everybody. My name is Eric Osterberg. I'm the assistant to the city manager down here in Klamath Falls. Steve. Hi, Eric. I'm Steve Dickey. I'm the director of uh, technology and program management for Salem Area Mass Transit District in Salem, Oregon. Mavis. I'm Mavis Hartz. I'm in the Grand, which is in Eastern Oregon, and I own a bike shop. Luis. Oh, I'm retired. I'm in Portland. It's nice to hear you guys. <laughs> I'm an OTSC you. member. Uh, Oregon Transportation Safety. Hi, Tracy. Yeah. And Tracy. Hi, I'm, <clears throat> excuse me, Tracy Pearl from ODOT Transportation Safety Division. I work out of the Salem. Already identified. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah, and I know that in our committee we had freight or we had freight representatives, we had transit representatives, we had representatives from OHA, but we also had representatives from um, other uh, advocacy groups, also for uh, safety and um, bike ped, and also uh, disabilities. Uh, the disabilities commission was also there, and you know they have a strong interest also in bike ped facilities as. Uh, many of their members have limited mobility options and you know Leanne mentioned earlier that the building of the ramps well the ramps also serve uh, the disabled community as well so. uh, I have a strong desire to include youth on this committee and I just still have not yet figured out how to do that so I I, I have a strong <coughs> desire to do that and surprise our new chair and vice chair I will be talking to you about that <laughs> <laughs> you can help me figure it out. Yeah, Leanne, I love that. And I'm thinking about the different types of like youth organizations that we work with and a really strong one so far has been um, Lake Girl Learn who support like at-risk youth and um, like houseless youth. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that could be really great. And just thinking about, you know, like our housing partners too, of like affordable housing and, you know, encouraging more like walking school buses, you know, um, at different complexes at different sites, that could be really cool as well. I don't know how non-traditional yeah. that is, but. I, was gonna, um, I agree with the youth and the, um, the affordable housing partners. That's such a huge conversation happening around, um, you know, the, the proximity of active transportation and and active transportation infrastructure next to affordable housing. The other thing that I think might be interesting for also to begin to consider is um, 
climate, it's not mentioned in any of the goals and it's going to be just it's huge, right? It's our next big crisis that, you know, all of the, um, a lot of the state agencies need to start refocusing. I, I would say it's similar to equity in that um, pretty, I, I foresee that eventually state agencies will need to have an overarching climate lens on their work. So beginning to think of what that means with the state back to school program, um, which there's obvious connections, uh, you know, is the other partner that I would begin to think on how to engage and, and bring into the conversation. There's, there's two other groups too that I, I was thinking of as one on the non-infrastructure side would be your neighborhood associations that really are, are representatives and input from the people who live in those neighborhoods. Uh, not talking so much homeowners association, but just the like Salem has, I think it's 18 neighborhood associations where people have opportunity to provide input. And then uh, the other would be, you know, a lot of what we end up dealing with is the aftermath of how uh, parts of our communities are developed. And so if we could get uh, involvement with uh, developers or or Home Builders Association that would help help them recognize the need that, you know, when we ask them to put in sidewalks, when they put in uh, a housing development, we're not asking them to do that just as a burden. We're asking that so it's a more livable community and it's safer for our kids that need to go to and from school and for kids to be able to play and be active in their in their neighborhoods. And so really helping them be a partner in that would be a big step forward because I know there's plenty of developers out there that if they can get out of not putting in the street improvements when they build, they would do it in a heartbeat because of the cost. But it's it's something that need, they need to understand the why behind that. Rob, do you have any um, follow up to that just from some of the work you're doing right now or your team's doing? Are you asking, you're asking me? Um, mm -hmm. Well, I just think that, you know, it's interesting, actually, we try to require developers to build um, access ways at the end of uh, cul-de-sacs. And our person who manages that program was saying that he sometimes has hearings officials deny them. And it would be nice if the state just said, you have to do this, you know, if you have a cul-de-sac. And so, you know, I think there's a role here for DLCD. Um, but, you know, he was asking me for data so he could prove that these things are needed. And I'm like, this is just a network. I mean, I was able to get him some data, but mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if anyone from my group had mentioned just my comment that having just having bicycle and pedestrian safety education everywhere. But I just think that's another piece of this that um, just is a good thing to have for us, whether this is. the new transit funds in Oregon, Eugene, and one small piece of the, our grant request is to pay for additional liability. Funding that we think of as transit. I mean, I think of bike shares as a form of transit, but, and I appreciate that ODOT seems open to that. So just thinking about bike share, or even, I don't know, I have mixed feelings about this, but I don't know if e-scooters are, are a good thing we want to encourage young people to use or not, but I mean, it's certainly more sustainable than driving. So that's just another thing that maybe is non-traditional that we want to think about. I'm sure high school kids would love to use them. But, and, you know, people are starting to buy their own, right? So that's something we're just going to probably start seeing more of. Um, just as an aside, since Sunny's on the call as well, this was something for a construction project down in Eugene that, um, a partnership between Project Delivery and Transportation Options funded a new bike share station across the river during construction. And um, it was hugely helpful to help build that baseline infrastructure. Uh, it's not necessarily near a school, but it is something to consider in the future if, if those layers all align. Um, that was funding through the Transportation Options Program. So you have a lot. And also there's a lot of new funding pockets coming up now. Um, and how those interplay that web of funding for that uh, end of access or the cul-de-sac um, 
how to tie people on to make that connection to the school. So that I think, um, Hannah, you have an online resource for training, communication and materials. I think that whole financing package there of, of new funding sources might be very helpful too. Um, any other thoughts? We, we just kind of scratched this, but you'll have an, again, you'll have an opportunity to review uh, the strategy and any other thoughts that come up. And the notes that we all took in our small group sessions will go into the notes for this meeting. And what, even though that we're not sharing them all back here, they will all get included into the feedback um, for, for next steps for that strategy. Yep, yep. Um, we are at the point of a marathon meeting to um, pause and look at what is coming down the pike for March. And Heidi, if you want to give us a quick overview of that. Yeah, um, just in summary of a, a little bit of what I already discussed, um, the next meeting is really starting into this big deep dive into the education program. Um, and so in March, uh, I'll be presenting to you the current program structure and what the uh, education program side is all about. Um, a lot of it will be review for you, but oh, there's been some new folks come in. Um, so I think it'd be a good place to just kind of present um, the, the past, present, and um, possibility of future for, for the education program um, and, and kind of discuss with you some of the challenges and barriers um, that I've uh, lessons learned and things that I've come across and uh, present to you some possible ideas that we have, but also ask you for some more. And all of this will be uh, grounded in this idea of a, a vision for change and expansion and thinking about um, how to make things more um, um, consistent with technical assistance, consistent with um, uh, a Leanne's program and, and how we're you know, um, really m melding a lot of this um, and being synergistic. So, um, so this will be more of an informational meeting, but also toward the end, a little bit of discussion and brainstorming. Um, and from there, I'll I'll be taking all that information that you guys um, input that you guys give back um, to come to the next meeting with um, some pos some um, possibilities of of moving forward. Um, that you can, that you'll help decide on. So other than that, I think that's it. Oh, I, there's one more thing that'll be at the March meeting and that's uh, revisiting the guiding principles. Right. Um, and I did hear, uh, Carolina, what you were saying about the climate, uh, that that might be an overarching potential guiding principle or that is woven into the guiding principles. So um, that, but can I also mention one more piece? Uh, Rob had a comment a while back that just said, uh, when we were talking about the statewide transportation improvement oh. program and said, given the low amount of non-highway in the current STIP statewide transportation improvement program, hopefully the Oregon Transportation Commission can put any stimulus funds partially to mm -hmm. transportation. And I just wanted to note that the fact that we did have a really good competitive process for how we uh, picked safe routes to school projects and there are more projects that we didn't pick like that is something that folks are asking me about internally like how can is there any way that we can base um, potentially fund more safe routes to school projects if 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 money comes in the door quickly for COVID stimulus and I don't have any answers on that yet but what I will tell you is that when 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 I do and I'm providing information internally for that that it'll come back to you to help um um, um, to help uh, recommend those projects. If we do end up getting to fund more safe routes projects that will come back here and would put potentially be in March if that becomes an opportunity. So I wanted to say that um, as well. Great, great. Um, so two final things. What we do at every SRAC meeting is just a quick debrief on um, how the meeting went. Um, I invite you to do that verbally or you can do it in the chat room. Um, <clears throat> so um, if you just want to raise your hands, if you want to do it verbally, or you can just do it in the chat, this is how we improve your meetings and make the best use of your time um, because it is your advisory committee. So um, <clears throat> if anyone wants to speak, just give us an indication, or again, you can just put it in the chat. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, gonna... I have a I have a question. It's not a feedback on the meeting. Is this the time sure. before we Let's close just put for that? Feedback on the meeting in the chat so we can take advantage of this. Great. Yeah. Please know. Um, I just wanted to ask about that. There was a last slide about the timeline in that the construction grant process will kick off again in spring 2022 and the education process will not be until 2023. Um, and my understanding is that that's because we're pushing out those education grants a little bit longer because of the pandemic. Um, I just wanna make sure that we're gonna be re-talking about the criteria for the construction grants. It looked like the schedule for 2021 was all education. And if spring 2022, we'll be doing a call for projects. I just wanna make sure there's gonna be adequate time because I had a lot of thoughts just since it just happened and it was my first time and I wasn't involved in the criteria setting before. Um, just curious about what that, how much time we'll have and how many meetings we'll have to discuss that. Leanne, do you have a... <clears throat> Um, so the, the, the timing that we did last time was um, we had a spring call out uh, in, tw in 2020. Um, we started talking about it in like December of the year before. Um, and so that's kind of where we've got it on the agenda uh, for, this, for this cycle. Um, uh, happy to try to move that up, intermix it with some of the education discussions. I think that we can build off I think the work that we're going to do around the education program will set us up to talk about the construction program later. So um, my plan right now is to bring that back up again next December or this coming December of 2021. And then we'll have um, the first couple of meetings of 2022 uh, to solidify the priorities and the scoring matrix um, with the goal of having the scoring matrix solidified before the application process starts. So we have a little bit of flexibility when that application process will start. Um, and we might have a couple of meetings near the beginning of 2022 to get that ready and then have fewer meetings at the end of 2022. So maybe we might front load those meetings. Um, Heidi and I have also talked about how, how this program is really great and flexible and it feels like things change all the time. So our schedule for 2022 is our best guess right now, but what we love about you all is how flexible everyone is to, to, to flow with what needs to happen next. So um, if that does not feel like enough time, if starting to talk about it in December, uh, it's starting to, that, that feels overwhelming, just uh, let me know. We're very open for feedback and can figure out how to make that feel better and talk about it earlier on. Thank you, appreciate that. Any other questions or comments before we wrap up? We have a couple of things in the chat of uh, liking the breakout groups. Groups could be longer. It was really nice to get a little bit more, um, more in depth in those breakout rooms. A lot of agreement about that. Um, but basically we like breakout rooms and would like them uh, longer. And, and one more, um, please, thoughts about this last competitive round. If you even even like teasers to send to uh, Leanne so we can make sure that we don't lose anything because a year can go by, new funding can come in, the whirlwind happens, someone presses puree and we forget. So um, please shoot those to Leanne. Um, and Rob and Carolina, do you want to say anything in ending the meeting as a uh, as the new chair and vice chair? Um, well, I just want to say thank you for um, you know everyone's commitment to this, and I think even though we're all on Zoom, I think it, you know um, people are really engaged. I think the breakout rooms are really a great way to make sure that more people can actually speak and and you know, get to know each other. And so I'd love to see more of that. And I just appreciate all the ODOT staff dedication to moving these programs forward. And you know, welcome to the new, um, the two new members of our committee. And I look forward to getting to know them. Great. Carolina, you have anything to add? Okay. Okay. I'll turn it back to you, Ms. Leanne. Um, I think that is everything that we've got. Um, 
if uh, folks want to take off and get a break before your next four o'clock meeting, please feel free to do so. Um, I do have a couple of maps that I can follow up pretty quickly with folks next week, um, answering a couple of the questions that were asked around the application cycle. I kept that um, part of my presentation really short, even though I have so much fun stuff to like talk about. Um, I'm really excited about um, those 43 new projects that we are, that that we got to fund because of all the hard work that y'all did. So. Um, look for that next week, and we're really excited for the for the March meeting. Um, yeah, thank you, thank you all for being here. And if anyone wants to call and talk about Star Trek, I'm constantly available. <laughs> Star Trek talk. <laughs> thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, thank you, for coming. Thank you. Bye bye. Um, for our staff people that might want to debrief about this, if y'all could stay on the line. Okay. We'll wait till everybody takes off. Bye, Lonnie. Nice to see you. Um, I think that worked. Felt like we talked a lot. Felt like we <laughs> talked a lot. Felt like I talked a lot. Um, I feel like I barely talked at all. <laughs> this, is, this is like a new world for me. I'm like, oh, I don't feel exhausted. This is great. So I think that there's just for the Alta folks, I think there's a lot of folks who had some ideas that we just didn't get to in on those four areas. I mean, I didn't even touch on some of the like coordination with the DMV and potential funding with the DMV. Um, so I, I think there's a lot there that maybe when we put out the well i i don't what is your i'm sorry i don't remember what the timeline is for the strategy document my my thought uh, my thoughts would be just why um can we just put it out for like a little bit of homework to them to come back to us with something in writing um to kind of flesh those out and have it instead of being at the next meeting or something I also think some of these ideas are like too detailed for the strategy, but are great for this next year of discussion around, all right, what are we going to do next? So um, I think it was great to get their juices flowing. I was so stoked to see how, how much they were talking about like partners and really the softer side of things. So um, I'm not that worried. Like I want to provide all, I haven't put my notes in that document yet, but I think a lot of those are pretty detailed for what's going to be in the strategy. And we're going to mm -hmm. build off of that with the next um, several meetings. So you might time. have like explore external partnerships and give examples. Mm -hmm. What I was interested in too, is that like my group did get to prioritizing, like which ones of these are important to you. And so I felt like that's probably going to end up being the more interesting conversation to have with the SRAC um, mm -hmm. because we're not going to be able to do it all and we're going to have to figure out how to prioritize it and that's going to be the hardest piece and they they so we didn't promise that they would have a role in that but that right. that my group got there and I thought that was really interesting mm -hmm. show off <laughs> like, like very I was so relaxed from not having to like talk the entire meeting. Time. <laughs> Tammy, you're always you've always got such good insights from from uh, all the SRAC work. You, I mean, you see it from a different perspective because we're in the thick of it and we've been working on it. What What were your thoughts? And do you mind if I eat while you talk? Oh. <laughs> Go for it. Yeah, um, meeting. <laughs> yeah, no, I was impressed. I mean, it was so much information, but it seemed like everybody was like with us throughout. Um, my group definitely started having some like they were like confused about the timeline and the things that are happening kind of simultaneously and like how that works. So we mostly talked about that. I feel like other folks probably have similar questions about like how how can we have a strategy done before we've talked about how the education program changes and, you know, but, um, but yeah, I do feel like if we can provide some sort of, you know, we can, we can do like a PDF review thing for the SRAC or have some way of having them. Like, I think once we have the strategy drafted, I think that getting their feedback on what is a priority for the, for, for the next 18 months will be helpful. Yeah. Because like you say, I think there's going to be more than there's actually money for. Yeah. And we'll have to prioritize. 
And Tammy, what did what did you think about the meeting? I thought it was good and very informative since I've been gone for a year. It was nice to catch up. Great. I like this format better than in person, I feel like. I don't know why. It's my personality type, I guess. I like I didn't have to figure out what to wear. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> that. <laughs> I put a jacket on. <laughs> I didn't have to text Leanne, I'm running late. Well, but I did do that. <laughs> um, any other thoughts, Katie or Heidi and Kaylin? I was wondering how much overlap there was from the homework that folks did with the comments they were sharing. And if I didn't actually look at that piece, um, like whether people were sharing things they had already said or new ideas. Kaylin synthesized their homework into that, that table. So that was their their feedback into that table. So my folks were giving me new stuff. New ideas. Yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Well. Yeah. It looked just from skimming over some of the notes that are in here already, I was like, oh, they're providing a lot more detailed mm -hmm. feedback now. Okay. Like they're cool. they're thinking more about instead of this high level kind of like, yeah, funding and grants, great. <laughs> they were yeah. like, yeah, there's some that, more. Which functions. makes sense because they have way more con context now. Yeah. Right. right. And I, I just think there's so many opportunities coming down the pike. Yeah. Funding and some probably creative leveraging or, you know, you can, even like the service that you can't get this grant because you don't fall into the right of way, but hey, look at this bucket of funds mm -hmm. over here. Um, and I really, my group really, Brian in particular was talking about kind of a sustainability, program sustainability coaching, like, here are the resources in your, I know we don't have funding for this, but here are the, you know, start thinking about this now or get it in your TSP or start talking to your fire district or your recreation mm -hmm. district kind of thing that, um, anyway, but yay. I think, I think what I'm taking away from this is like, um, I really would like to do more breakout groups with them and I want to figure out how to make that possible. And maybe instead of, um, I do like giving them homework that's like, answer these questions. I think that's really important and helps set us up, but could we potentially give them like, read this document and then we can do less presenting? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can we, cause I really want, uh, my ideal um, online meeting is present like, like half and half, like half activities, half presentation. And honestly, I want all of the presentations up front in an hour so I can do a walk. And I want to come back for the second half and have it be really interactive. Mm -hmm. Like that's how I want to do a three hour meeting. Mm -hmm. and I don't know how to get there because we have a lot of information. We have a lot of flow, like, like it makes sense to do things in a certain order and maybe not mm -hmm. match presentations mm -hmm. and activities, but like in this new online world, like that's how I want to do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I feel like a staff report, it would be appropriate to have more of the content in something that's been prepared we could consider doing more of like a staff report. Um, mm -hmm. Goes out with the invite. And then yeah. we just yeah. highlight for any questions, but you don't have to go into all the detail. Because we do a, an internal quarterly report to our division administrators. It's pretty high level, but that's probably something that could be more public if we wanted to do that. Mm -hmm. it might be something that we could look to Alta as a technical assistant, because you're providing us with a lot of reports. Like maybe one of those reports could be a more external facing update mm -hmm. that goes out to the SRAC before their meetings. Um, yeah, I mean, even for the next one, when we're talking about um, this, you know, the looking back on the education program, like a work, we're pulling together a lot of that content in terms of the numbers and the data associated with what we can, what we can report on for previous um, TAP uh, activities. And that, that's going to be like the, the pre preface to our work plan. And that could be in a staff report really easily. Mm -hmm. yeah. So What's I, the timeline? Like, how how soon in advance would you need something like that prepared? Um, I feel like we're a little bit cart before the horse because um, I'm looking at Heidi because I'm 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 wondering in your brain like what are the things that you want the SRAC to discuss? What are mm -hmm. the things that you just want them to know? And then we could 
potentially create some of those things. Um, basically, we have a we have a it's it's March eighteenth, so like we would ideally send them any materials that they need to read. They actually asked for more time. Um, like the last homework that we gave them, they said that it, the timing was too, too was too quick of a turnaround. Um, so I think that we should give them two weeks to read something and respond to it if we can. Ten days, two weeks. So that would put us sending something out early March. But uh, it comes back to kind of like Heidi and what do we want to get out of that ne next meeting and what do you present mm -hmm. and discuss versus like update? What do they need to know? Yeah, to be honest with you, I, I think three quarters of the meeting should be discussion and um, coming to kind of a priority list because the way I'm looking at the schedule, um, you know, the, the next meeting is basically me or us coming back and saying, we took your feedback um, and now we've come up with uh, basically something that we'd like to go with. These are our uh, recommendations to go forward. We'd like to see if you, you know, agree with that. Um, and so I think a lot of the review, like I wrote this down just while we were in, uh, in the meeting thinking about next, next one.